Okay, it seems like uh, we are live. So let's give it maybe 10 seconds and then uh, we can get started. Okay, I, th I see the live stream on my screen as well. That's good. Okay, great. Uh, well, welcome everyone uh, uh, for our 15th lecture in computer architecture. Uh, today, uh, as we discussed last week, uh, today and tomorrow, we're going to cover some cutting edge research in computer architecture. And you will get to see eight uh, papers uh, that were very recently published uh, in top uh, computer architecture conferences. Uh, and these are uh, papers from the TAs of the course, actually, people who are in the Safari group. Uh, and today we have four papers. Uh, I will introduce each of them when the time comes, but we're going to cover a variety of topics. And the first one is going to be on prefetching, and you're doing a lab on prefetching clearly, and this could be something you can examine in your lab as well. Rahul, who's a PhD student in my group, is going to talk about Pythia, a customizable hardware prefetching framework using online reinforcement learning. Uh, so basically, in this work, uh, he's using reinforcement learning principles to make prefetching much more effective. And uh, I think this, as we discussed in uh, last lectures, using machine learning to improve uh, controller decisions is going to be an important area. And it's, in my opinion, it's fascinating. It's going to be much more important in the future. And this is one example of using specifically reinforcement learning to actually make much better prefetching decisions. Okay, uh, I think Rahul, uh, if you're ready, uh, you can get started. Yeah, yeah thanks Anu, for the introduction. Um, so hi everyone. Uh, I'm Rahul. So I'm a third year PhD student and working with Professor Mutlu. Uh, so today I'm going to uh, talk about our recent work with here, customizable hardware prefetching framework using online reinforcement learning. So this work has been uh, presented last month in micro 2021. So, so yeah, so let's get started. So I hope by now it's kind of evident for all of you that memory latency is a big problem for current memory microarchitectures. So I won't just want to reiterate on this figure again that in last couple of decades, we have seen like a lot of increase in memory capacity as well as bandwidth, but then memory latency kind of remain almost the same. So this creates a huge performance bottleneck, not like especially for the like today's workloads, which is highly uh, like they have a huge data footprint. So, uh, so these are the four horsemen that we architects have developed over the years that uh, are the conventional lat latency tolerance techniques. So that's that's like out of order execution, multi-threading, caching, and prefetching. So in this lecture, we are just focusing on prefetching to be exact. So, so okay, so what is prefetching? So pre prefetching, the key idea behind prefetching is to fetch the data before it is needed by the program. So hence the name prefetching, right? So why do we want to do this? Because um, we can, if we can prefetch accurately and early enough, then we can potentially reduce or completely eliminate uh, long latency memory accesses. So clearly it involves predicting which program, uh, which addresses the program is going to be needed in the future, right? And then typically this works very well for programs if they have a very regular access pattern, but then it might actually misfire sometime when the program has irregular access pattern or let's say some, some kind of random access patterns, right? So now the question is like, does prefetching, uh, a misprediction in prefetching affect the correctness? The answer is no, because uh, prefetching data from a mispredicted address is simply just not used in the program. So it essentially does not uh, require the, uh, like changes the correctness of the program in a sense. So it doesn't need any uh, state recovery, uh, for example, let's say branch misprediction or the value misprediction. So, so these are the, traditional uh, evaluation matrix of a prefetcher, which is coverage, accuracy, and timeliness. So coverage is defined as the ratio between the used prefetch and the total demanded memory access from the core. Uh, the accuracy is defined as the ratio between the used prefetch divided by the sent total number of prefetches that it has generated. And the timeliness is defined as memory access latency saved by a prefetch request. So all of these matrix, we want it to be as high as possible. There are other, or matrix that is also kind of, let's say second order, but it's also equally important to understand the impact of a prefetcher on overall systems performance, which is bandwidth consumption, cache pollution, energy consumption, et cetera. So I'll, I'll go through all of this and then how they actually impact the systems overall performance in the like couple of slides. 
So, so to design an efficient prefetcher, we essentially need to define three key questions. So what do we want to prefetch? When do we want to prefetch? And how do we want to prefetch? So now let's take a look at like each of these questions and try to answer faithfully as possible. So the what question essentially says that what addresses we want to prefetch at all, right? Now, the thing is that if we prefetch a useless data that actually waste resources, like precious resources in uh, core, like memory bandwidth, cache or prefetch buffer space, energy consumption, all of which can actually be utilized by demand request or more accurate prefetch request otherwise. So the key takeaway from this slide is that accurate prediction is necessary or let's say it's, it's required to improve a performance of a system, okay? So then the second question is that, when to initiate a prefetch request? Now, the thing is that if you prefetch too early, then the data might not be used before it is uh, evicted from the cache, right? But if you prefetch also too late, then you, you might not even hide the whole memory access latency. So ideally we would want that the prefetches would be just in time. Like whenever you want it, you just get it. So that's the best case scenario. And then the third question is that, how do we want to do the prefetch? So there are like three broad topics of how, how, how we do prefetching in the traditional architectures. So the first one is uh, the software prefetching, which is uh, injected by the programmer or the compiler itself, that they uh, explicitly inject prefetch instructions. The second one is called the execution-based prefetching. And the, you know, like a very good example is uh, Professor Mutlu's work on, on run-ahead execution. So in, the, in this case, a thread or some, some execution context is executed to preface the data for the main program. And the third uh, way of prefetching is the hardware prefetching. So where the hardware itself monitors the processor memory accesses and tries to you know, mine patterns from this address stream of the program is generating. And it would also try to generate prefetches accordingly. Okay. So in this lecture, we would specifically focus on hardware prefetching to be exact. So now let's let's try to understand like how a hardware prefetcher tries to mine patterns from program address streams. So I'll give you two examples of uh, of this uh, technique. So let's let's say in the first example, of instruction with the program counter X is accessing the addresses in the following pattern: a, a plus d, a plus two d, a plus three d, and so on and so forth. So for, what you can learn from this access pattern is that okay, if PCX is uh, PCX is probably accessing a pattern with a stride d. Right, And so how we can leverage that learning that you can say that, okay, if PCX is again trying to access some address B, then you would simply inject a prefetch request to B plus D. Okay, so that's one example of uh, how hardware prefetches essentially tries to learn. So another example can be, let's say, uh, you, you are seeing some last few cache accesses like this, A, A plus three, A plus five, A plus eight, and so on and so forth. So what you can learn from this access stream is that, okay, cache line delta, like the, the, the gap between two cache lines are kind of like plus three, plus two, plus three, plus two, and it's repeating like this. So if you can learn this and how you can leverage this learning that, okay, if my last cache line delta was, let's say three, then my next uh, prefetch would be, you know, two cache lines ahead. If my last delta was, uh, let's say plus two, then my next prefetch would be plus three ahead. So these are the like two, typical examples of how hardware itself can learn uh, patterns from memory accesses. So now, uh, so these, this, this information like PC or let's say the sequence of cache line delta that I showed. So these informations are actually called program features. So which essentially represents a execution of a program context in the program, right? So a prefetcher essentially tries to learn the access pattern that are present in the memory request and try to correlate with this program feature. So the idea here is that whenever this program feature repeats, most likely that the same access pattern is going to be repeated again. So they would leverage that fact saying that, okay, if this program feature is repeating, then I would predict with the same access pattern. So that's the key idea here. So there are some other, other examples of program feature can be, you know, branch pro program counters, page number, page offset, and so, so many more, right? Or, or it can be actually many combinations of these uh, attributes also, okay? So now that, said so we have a kind of a brief background of prefetching so now let's let's dive into this walk that that we have presented right so so okay so this is the executive summary of the uh, walk um, so okay so in this work we actually identify three key shortcomings of almost all prior prefetches that we have seen let's say last in two decades 
So these three shortcomings are that they normally predict using only one program feature, they lack inherent system awareness, and they lack in silicon customizability. So I'll, I'll explain each of these shortcomings more in the, in the later slides. So what we want to do in, in this walk is that our goal is to design a prefetching framework that alleviates these three problems. How? The goal is twofold. So we want to learn from multiple program features instead of just relying on one program feature. And we also want to learn from inherent system level feedback information. So that's one, one uh, target. And the second target is that the prefetching framework that we are trying to design, it should be customizable in silicon. So what do we mean by customizable in silicon means we can program it or reprogram it in the silicon as we want. Okay. So, so towards this, we introduce Pythia. The crux of the Pythia's idea is that we would formulate the prefetching as a reinforcement learning problem. And we'll show that, okay, Pythia outperforms multiple prior state of the art prefetches in a wide range of workloads and system configurations. And Pythia is completely open source. You can also get it, uh, you, would, you would see it in, in the lab four, I guess. Yeah. So, okay, so now, now let's start with the key shortcomings of prior prefetches. So the question that we started asking, okay, why these prefetches do not perform well? I mean, we have tons of prefetcher uh, proposals, right? So why they are not performing well the way as we expected. So we identify like three key shortcomings that, that significantly limits their performance improvement. The first is that they mainly use one program uh, feature for prediction. The second one that they have very less inherent system awareness. And the third one is that they lack in silicon customizability. So now let's try to analyze each of these three uh, key problems in, in detail. So what is the problem of having single uh, feature prefetch prediction? So the thing is that if you, if a prefetcher only relies on, on one specific type of feature for prediction, then the performance gain that we should expect from that prefetcher is only dominant for those workloads where that feature to pattern correlation exists. But in all the other classes of workloads, it, it, it just doesn't work, right? So just to show you an example, so this is the performance chart of uh, two different prefetchers that, sorry, uh, this is the performance chart of two different prefetchers, which is pre presented in recent years across four different types of workloads. On the y-axis, we have the IPC improvement over the baseline. So higher, the better, basically. So what we are seeing here is that bingo, one prefecture which is proposed in 2019, so it, it actually performs better than the uh, SPP prefecture uh, by, let's say, almost as, as big as 15.4%. But then it's not the entire side of the story. So you, you will also see some workloads where SPP is actually performing better than the bingo. So the why is that the case? The, the reason is this, that bingo as a prefecture or SPP as a prefecture, they actually try to leverage to different types of program feature for prediction. And as a result, what happens is that some workloads, bingo would perform better. And in some other workloads, SPP would perform better. And then that's what it is. So, so the key takeaway from this figure is that if you essentially relying on single program feature for prediction, you're actually leaving a lot of performance improvement on the table. So ideally we should want to uh, learn from multiple program feature to you know, provide a performance benefit across a wide range of workloads, okay? So the second key shortcoming that we understand is that, okay, so all of these prefetches, like most of the prefetches, they have very little understanding of their uh, undesirable effects on the system. So for example, let's say memory bandwidth usage or the cache pollution. And as a result, what happens is that they often lose performance improvement in resource constraint configurations. So let me give you an, another example here. So I know this, this slide is kind of busy. So, uh, so what we are trying to show here is the following. So you, you, you have two different workloads, the LIGRA CC and the PASIC Canil. On the left-hand side, you have the coverage and uh, over prediction chart. On the right-hand side, you have the performance chart. So here you can see that uh, the green part is basically the coverage. So we would want as high as possible. And the, uh, the white part is the uncovered part. So basically we would want white part to be vanishing and green part to be as high as 100%. And at the same time, we would also want this red part, which is you know, extra prediction, which we could have just simply truncated to be as zero as possible, okay? So what I want you to focus is the following. So bingo as a prefecture in LIGA CC and Parsec Canil, it actually has similar kind of coverage, right? And it, it also has like in, in LIGA CC, it actually has like significantly lower over predictions. But then the thing is like, if you, if you look into the performance side of the story, 
uh, Ligra CC is actually even like bingo in Ligra CC is underperforming even the no prefetching baseline. So what it essentially says that if you just simply do, disable the prefetcher, your performance is better than enabling the prefetcher. But why is the case? It's it's showing similar coverage. It's it's even having less over prediction, but it's still underperforming. But here it's it's actually overperforming. So the reason why this is this contrasting outcome is here is the following that the Ligra CC as a workload, it itself has high memory bandwidth demand. So now what happens is if you even if you make a small amount of over prediction in this case, it actually has a huge detrimental impact in the overall performance than let's say even even higher over prediction in this case. So, so the key point that I'm trying to make here is that a performance benefit of a prefecture is not only dependent on the coverage or the accuracy. It also needs to take the system awareness into consideration, like memory bandwidth usage or, the, or, or, or let's say cache pollution to provide a performance improvement over a large set of workloads or a large uh, set of uh, system configurations. But if you don't take this system awareness into consideration, then you would eventually lose a lot of performance improvement. Okay, So that's the second uh, key problem. The third key problem that we uh, identify in this work is that they lack, like all prior prefetches, they lack in silicon customizability. So what, what it essentially means that whenever you are designing a prefecture, you are essentially creating, you are making some static decisions that, oh, I want to uh, leverage this program feature for prediction. I want to, uh, you know, mine the pattern like this. And once you uh, fix those uh, static decisions, and then you actually create a, sorry, uh, then you create a rigid hardware that explicitly designed to exploit that program feature. And you cannot literally change any part of that prefecture once it's taped out in the processor, okay? So that actually uh, like creates a lot of problem because it cannot adapt to workloads that you, you would actually see in your processors to be executing, right? So if you want to change let's say any part of that prefecture, let's say if you want to change the objective of the prefecture, if you want to change the uh, feature of the prefecture, then you essentially need to design a new prefecture from scratch. You have to verify, you have to fabricate finally. And basically this, this cycle just simply repeats for every new prefecture that you design, right? So this significantly wastes like human development cycle as well as, you know, like so many multi-million dollars probably. So, so the goal of our work is simple. So we, we want a prefetcher framework, let's say a prefetching framework that can autonomously learn to prefetch from multiple program context information, as well as the system level bandwidth, like, uh, sorry, system level feedback, like bandwidth utilization or cache pollution, et cetera. And at the same time, it should have some sort of capability to be customized in silicon, even after we designed it and taped it out in the processor. It should be customizable. It should be programmable in some sense. So that th those two are the design. Uh, so let's a goal for our work. So towards this, we introduced Pythia. So the key idea of Pythia is to formulate prefetching as a reinforcement learning problem. So before going into the, uh, the next stage, uh, do we have any questions till now? Okay. So so now let's uh, let's let's quickly deep dive into what reinforcement learning is, and and I hope you have learned. Uh, from the self-learning memory controller paper also, right? So we will leverage same similar type of idea in this case. So, okay, reinforcement learning in a nutshell, it's the algorithmic approach to take an action in a given situation to maximize a numerical reward. So every RL system is composed of two uh, key components, the agent and the environment. So the agent senses the state of the environment at every discrete time step. After sensing that step, uh, state, uh, it takes some, some actions. And for this action, the agent receives the reward from the environment, which it uses to reinforce the correlation between the state and the action. So basically, it, it tries to understand, given this reward, that how good is to take that action in that state. Uh, it's, it's, it's a very like uh, crux of that uh, problem statement. So for this learning the correlation, agent stores something called Q value for every state action pair, which essentially... Uh, means that the Q value for a state action pair essentially means that how much reward you should expect for taking that action in that given state. Okay, so uh, now if you if if the agent is in, in a some state, then it would just simply uh, query its its knowledge. Say that okay, if I'm in this state, 
what is the action that would give me the highest Q value? So that means that that the one, I, if I'm a greedy agent, I would say that, okay, that, that, that's that the action that I should take because it, it, it's probably the uh, best uh, action for me based on the rewards that I'm getting, okay? So in this case, what we are doing is that uh, we are formulating prefetching as a reinforcement learning problem where the prefetcher itself acts as the RL agent and the processor and memory subsystem acts as the environment. So from every demand request that the processor is executing, the Pithya, the prefetcher, it, it tries to extract some, some uh, features from that uh, demand request. So for example, let's say PC or let's say Delta I have shown before, right? So some features from that, uh, from, from, from that demand request uses as a state information to take a prefetch decision. Okay, and for every prefetch decision, it takes a reward from the uh, processor sub memory subsystem that evaluates the usefulness of the prefetch request. It means like how good was that prefetch, uh, how useful was that prefetch, how accurate, uh, or let's say how timely was that prefetch. Okay, so so now now let's let's try to concretely define like uh, the state, the action, and the reward for for our our, our definition. So we define state as a, a k-dimensional vector of program features, right? Where, where, where each program feature is composed of two key information, the control flow information and the data flow information. I mean, I, I just want to you know, repeat it again. Like what are the examples of control flow information is like which path of uh, instructions the program is executing. Let's say PC or branch PC or last three PCs. And you can think of many other examples for control flow information and simply, uh, and similarly, we will also think of data flow examples are like which which data that the program is trying to touch. Like what is the cache line address that you have touched last last time? What is the physical num page page number? What is the delta between two cache line addresses? And many more. You can think of it like. And any any uh, information that you can think of as a data flow or the control flow information can potentially be used as a feature. Okay. So, so, okay, so let, let me give you an example of a state uh, information uh, like, like this. So here the, the state is composed of two features, the PC plus Delta and the sequence of last four deltas. That's the first, second feature, okay? So the first feature is for the composed of control flow information like PC and the data, uh, data flow information like Delta. Whereas the second feature is just purely composed of data flow information, which is sequence of last four deltas, okay? In this case, the Plus is the addition. You can think of it as a ZOR operation. You can think of it as like a normal addition operation. You can just simply try out, and we have tried out like lots of, you know, like hashing functions and, and, and like operations to to concatenate these uh, like features. Okay. Okay. So now let's let's go to the action definition. So what do we mean by action? So action uh, is defined as, as the follows. So given a demand access to address A, the action is defined as a selection of prefetch offset O. So if you have, if, if the agent is selecting an offset O, so what it basically says that you want to issue a prefetch request to A plus O, okay? So now if you, if you consider a processor which is operating with a 4 KB physical page and 64 byte cache line, so it essentially says that you have 64 cache lines in a page. And we normally don't issue prefetches in physical memory beyond a physical page limit. So that's what actually limits uh, the, the range of offset that you can think of. So it's basically 127 offsets that you can ever think of. It's, it's basically in the region of uh, plus 63 to minus 63. Okay, because you, you can go forward from any, any, uh, any given uh, cache line in the page. You can also go backwards. So that's, that, that gives you like minus 62 to plus 63 range. Okay. So, yeah, so as, as I said, like, like this, this limits are essentially uh, telling you that you should not go beyond the page, uh, physical page boundary. And you, you should also take note that zero is an also valid action for Pythia, which essentially means that, oh, I, I don't want to prefetch anything for now. So that's, that's a valid action also, okay? Ah, okay, so now let's define the reward. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, why do we stay within a page when prefetching? Okay, so the reason why we want to stay within a physical page is the following. So, so first of all, if you if we are going beyond a physical page boundary, right, then we don't even know whether that physical page is mapped to our process or not, because your your process might be swapped out and then somebody else might be swapped in, 
and the the physical page that used to be with you before it might not be with you now right and in that case it, it's a like a severe security violation if you just touch someone else's physical page right so that's why in if we are prefetching in a physical uh, address space we normally don't go beyond the physical page boundary okay that's a good question so do we have any 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 questions till now yeah go ahead so it's um an offset um, that it predicts coming from the last memory access location, right? Yes, that's true. So, so it, it basically says that, okay, the program is currently demanding address A. Given this current demand, what I want to prefetch next. So if it is current demand is A, then I want to prefetch A plus O. Make sense? Yeah, I think that makes sense. So. Because like the input you give it is a program counter and a bunch of delta information, uh -huh. so I'm just thinking like, how does this know the, the address that's being requested from that? Unless I guess you also have like um a, a separate data input to this system that also gives it the address. Is that what? Yeah. Happens? So so this is this is not the absolute address that we want to generate. So we are generating an offset between what what we want to prefetch, right? So if your if your current demand is let's say cache line X, right? So what I want is not the next uh, the prefix the ad uh, the prefix address of the next cache line. I just want to say that how far I want to prefix from this current demand. So I'm just basing my prediction on what the program is actually generating now, like accessing now. I just want to like yeah. So, so, so the question that I'm asking to the prefetcher is the following: that you have seen this this is the cache line the program is accessing. Given that cache line is accessed. What do you want to prefetch now? How far do you want to prefetch from, from that cache line? So that's the offset here, the, the offset. Over. Okay. Any more questions? Okay, perfect. So so yeah, so now now let's define the reward for Pythia. So the reward is defined as uh, the objective, that objective for Pythia. So this is the main crux of the problem. So how do you define the reward? Is how would you expect the uh, agent to be behaving? So in this case, we, we uh, define rewards that encapsulates two key metrics, the prefetch usefulness and the system level feedback information, like uh, memory bandwidth usage, pollution, energy, et cetera. So though we can literally incorporate any type of system level feedback in our framework, we actually, uh, let's say, demonstrate this, uh, the eff efficacy of this uh, framework using memory bandwidth usage as an example, system level feedback, okay? So this is how we define the rewards. It's, it's actually categorized in, in, in different reward levels. And each of these reward levels are roughly corresponding to various usefulness of a prefetch request. Like, for example, accurate and but late means that, OK, uh, my prefetch was correct. But then it was predicted a bit late. The, by the time the program actually demanded, my prefetch was not filled yet. OK, something like that. Uh, and note that inaccurate and the no prefetch uh, is further categorized based on the memory bandwidth usage, the high memory bandwidth usage or the low memory bandwidth usage. Now, the values of each of these reward levels are set at design time via automatic design space exploration. However, we can uh, like change the values of these reward levels uh, on the fly, like via customized and registers. So you, you can set it in silicon itself, and that actually changes the uh, the objective that we are sending to Pythia. Okay, so now, now, now let, let me uh, like quickly describe what do I mean by uh, changing the objective of Pythia by uh, like different reward values. So let's let, let's consider these these reward values, right? So we are we are providing uh, so let's say accurate for twenty and twelve, and then we are providing uh, inaccurate prefetch reward for minus eight, minus fourteen, and the no prefetching reward levels to be minus two, minus four, and so on, right? So what do we what do we tell Pythia by this reward? We tell Pythia something like this, that, oh, I'm giving you much more uh, uh, like fork for generating an accurate prefetch request. So what it would learn is that if I, if I can generate accurate prefetch request, I'm getting much more reward from the environment, right? So, okay, I'll, I'll prefer to generate accurate prefetch request whenever possible. But then if, if, we, if I can't, then what is happening? Then, then we are legitimately, like deliberately, we are providing a slightly higher prefetch, uh, reward for generating no prefetch request than the inaccurate prefetch if the memory bandwidth usage is low. So what essentially we are telling the prefetcher is that, oh, if your memory bandwidth usage is low, is the system's memory bandwidth usage is low, then you should, you know, some you should favor 
doing no prefetching rather than prefetching something inaccurate. You know what? And in the case of let's say high memory bandwidth usage, we are providing a minus two as a reward for no prefetching and minus fourteen as a reward for inaccurate prefetching, which which essentially says that if the memory bandwidth usage is really high, then there is much more POC for just staying quiet rather than prefetching something inaccurate. So it essentially says that if your memory bandwidth usage is high, then you would strongly prefer not to prefetch rather than prefetching inaccurately. Okay. Now, if we change these reward levels by a little bit, let's say just increase the reward level values for no prefetching while decreasing the reward level values for inaccurate prefetching, you actually provide different objective to Pythia. How is that? It still continues to favor uh, accurate prefetch generation because we are still providing much higher band, like perk for accurate prefetching. But then, if we if we can't generate accurate prefetching, then what happens is that for like irrespective of whether the bandwidth usage is low or high, it actually has much more perk for generating no prefetch rather than prefetching something inaccurate. So it just simply favors that. Oh, I will just stay, stay quiet. I won't do anything. So that essentially makes Pythia conservative towards prefetching, like really, really conservative. It, it becomes picky. So now you can say, like, why do we need this? It's actually necessary, or, or let's say it's it's good to have this in case of server class processes where you know, like, you have so many cores and the effective bandwidth for each core is very less, or let's say bandwidth sensitive workloads like large scale graph analytics, like social graphs and passing Facebook graphs, like that. So this is really like uh, required for repurposing Pythia for this type of workloads. Okay. So now let me give you a very brief overview of how Pythia works. So Pythia essentially contributes to uh, like two key uh, key components: the queue value store, which is recording queue values for all state action pairs, and evaluation queue, which is a FIFO queue of recently taken actions. So for every demand request, Pythia first uses the address of the demand request to look into the evaluation queue. And if the address is found in the evaluation queue, it assigns some entry. Uh, it's assigned some reward to their entry saying that, oh, you know what? I have prefetched something here in the evaluation queue. Let's say like how you have added in the evaluation queue. And now that's also getting demanded. So that means whatever I have predicted is actually correct. So that's the idea here. So the next step is that for every demand request, you would extract a state vector, use the state vector to look up the QV store, find the action that has the maximum Q value, and then use the action to generate the prefetch request. Note that this, this action can also be like zero action. So that means in that case, you won't generate any prefetch request whatsoever. Okay. So now for every action that you are taking, you would also enqueue that prefetch action along with the state action pair in the evaluation queue. So that actually keeps track of what the what are the predictions that Pythia has made in this evaluation queue. Whenever you are enqueuing something in the back, you are uh, like evicting something from the front of the queue, right? So you would use the the reward value that you have you have stored in the head of the uh, head entry. You would use it to update the queue value stone. And the last piece of the puzzle is that uh, for every prefetch fill that is happening in the cache, you would also set uh, look up in the evaluation queue and set a fill bit. So basically, this filled bit would be necessary when you are uh, identifying the uh, timeliness of a prefetch request, like how uh, how timely it was. Okay, so I won't go to the nitty gritty or let's say the gory details of the like design uh, in, in this lecture. So, but I, I would encourage everyone to you know go through the paper if you really find it interesting. And, and yeah, I mean we, we have explained a lot like how we can uh, let's say uh, like divide this this structure and make it fast to look up and fast to retrieve the data okay so now let's let's quickly go to the evaluation results so we evaluated pythia in a cham cham sim trace driven sim uh, cham sim trace driven simulator you would use it for uh, yeah sorry uh, can we go through a bit of uh, how the rewards are generated how the rewards are sorry uh, how the rewards are generated the the uh, how we assign rewards to this thing no 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 yeah kind of i mean okay. should we read the paper for it or no, no i mean idea? okay I, I i can say in 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 a bit like like bit detail so so the idea here is the following so so let's say uh, you you so whenever you are issuing some prefetch right so you have like two options here like oh did i do some prefetching that is going beyond the page boundary if that's the case then 
that's a very no no thing right we we cannot do anything so, so i would assign a reward then itself okay if if or there is another case that okay I, my prefetcher actually decided not to prefetch anything so that means like a zero action in that case you also know like what what would be the reward it's like zero actions reward okay now if if this is not from this class then you cannot assign reward now okay so you you would just simply wait in the entire evaluation queue you would wait for the program to demand this uh, cash line if there is any if if by the time in the evaluation queue so in in the evaluation queue you are getting enqueued here and you are getting dequeued here so you are traveling from the tail to the head of the queue right by that time if you have seen a demand request to the evaluation queue then you know that whatever you have predicted is correct and then you we would assign reward accordingly but if you haven't seen any views here just so then by the time you are getting kicked out you know that okay i have made probably some wrong decisions that the program hasn't demanded it yet so yeah maybe i should assign a incorrect reward so then it would in, uh, assign an incorrect reward here okay so yeah, I, i would say like maybe go through the paper and we have like like explained it in the very detail but yeah, i mean this is the like kind of like a summary of of how we do it listen okay a any more questions perfect okay so if not then uh, i'll go through it i have time yeah maybe i have time right okay yeah. so okay so so let's let's quickly go through the evaluation so we use champsim we would use in lab lab 4 we would actually use uh, you check out pythias repository and, and you you can just simply play around with its performance and, and all of it right so we are, so some of these traces are also there in your lab right and and we are actually like tried out with multiple traces and if anyone of you is interested to evaluate it for let's say full trace list actually we have like more than 150 we have like some something around 2400 traces so if you want to evaluate just please let me know and i i can just simply point give you the pointer of evaluation okay so so yeah i mean and we we evaluate against five state of the art features and uh, these are as follows but in the repository that that we have open sourced here you would see like lots of other prefetches also like like i i guess something from 26 plus like we, we, sorry not not 26 i mean 2006 onwards any prefetches that have been proposed here okay so now let's let's quickly go through the evaluation so let's see how how prefetches perform in various uh, like systems with various number of cores in this case we are increasing the number of cores on the x axis right so this is how prior prefetches perform spp m log bingo right and this is what pithia performs so as you can see pithia significantly outperforms prior prefetches in all type of core configuration so in in single core it it actually outperforms next best prefetcher by 3.4% in 12 core it outperforms by 7.7% on average so the takeaway here is that it not only outperforms in all core configuration but also the performance improvement increases with the number of cores so okay so now let's let's take a look at uh, pithia's performance in various dram bandwidth configuration so on x axis if you go on the positive direction you are actually increasing the memory bandwidth and and keep keep a note that this one essentially means that uh, like anything be below this one is essentially saying that uh, you know just should disable the prefetch i mean even just disabling the prefetch should be even better so so this is how prior prefetches perform as you can see like a lots of configurations here it's it's actually better to just disable the prefetch rather than having it okay and as you, and this is uh, now if if you're saying like okay maybe this this bandwidth configurations are like too strict actually that's not the case because all of these configurations are roughly matching like traditional co like commercial processes like per core bandwidth and commercial processes so so yeah i mean these these like configurations are real world and as you can see like pithia significantly outperforms in every type of dram bandwidth configuration also in the highest dram uh, bandwidth configuration it's outperforming like 3% in the lowest dram bandwidth configuration it's outperforming like 17% on average so the in performance improvement is actually drastic the the more constrained you are making the system so that actually tells you like this is the reason why we need rl for for this type of system like you you should know what what is happening in the system how how much is the bandwidth usage and then try to act accordingly rather than just being completely oblivious to the memory bandwidth usage okay so so yeah and and then performance over like area overhead is also low so i won't go to like details on this thing 
And this is open source. I would encourage everyone to you know check out the repository if you want to take a look at it. Okay, so that that would conclude my talk briefly. Uh, I'll just briefly reiterate that we have identified three key problems in this pro uh, paper that it predicts mainly using one single program feature. It lacks inherent system awareness and uh, prior prefetches uh, lack in silicon customizability. So our goal was to design a prefetching framework that can learn from multiple features and system level feedback and can be customized in silicon also for different uh, to use different features and prefetching objectives. So towards this, we introduced Pythia that formulates prefetching as a reinforcement learning problem. And we show that Pythia significantly outperforms multiple prefetches in a wide range of uh, bandwidth uh, system configurations and workloads. So, so yeah, I think that that concludes my presentation. If if you have any questions, I'll be happy to. Yeah, okay, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll go. Do you have any uh, any idea if uh, manufacturers are interested in implementing it? Uh, this one, yeah. I mean, I, mean, uh, I have I have uh, like I, I got some uh, reviews and, and and feedback from from uh, uh, let's say real world manufacturer uh, companies also, right? So definitely this is in this iteration of the paper, it's definitely implementable, right? Whether they would implement it or not, that's completely up to them, right? But we can only do our best to show them the benefits of this uh, like approach, right? And I hope that we have convinced them. Uh, now let's see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I'll let it go. Yeah. Uh, yeah, just wonder what features you are using in the evaluation. Ah, that's a good question. So I think I have somewhere in this long list of slides. Yeah, if I can go there, okay, maybe I can just simply go there from here. Yeah, so so these are the features that I'm using. So th this is the two features, right? And and each of these features are kind of hybrid attributes. So one attribute feature is PC plus Delta. So one is coming from the uh, data flow, another is coming from the control flow. And the, another one is simple uh, data flow information, but a cascaded data flow information is like last for Delta. It's a basically a tracking a path of Delta trajectory and then trying to understand. So, so these are the two features that in collaboration prefetches uh, for, for us in Pythium. But yeah, when we have tried out with uh, other uh, like other features also, and we have added, uh, so you should go to the appendix, like the, the, the paper that I mentioned here, right? The appendix section, we have like evaluated lots of lots of features and how they are different and what type of workloads they're different, you, you would see in the appendix. Okay, yeah. Oh, yeah, sorry, sorry. Also, another quick question. So can the feature vector be configured on the flight or it is fixed in the city? The features. You mean? Uh, the feature vector. No, no, no. The feature use. vector is completely configurable. You, you can, you can, like, literally, you can change this to, as you go. Like, you, you can, you just simply have a configuration register. You say that, okay, I, I want feature ID ten, and I want feature ID ninety three. I want feature ID, let's say two, two, two fifty six. Uh, you would have it. The only thing that is fixed is how many features that you can use, because that part is essentially tied to the area overhead of the prefecture. So we cannot ask, let's say, we, we, we cannot make a, like a configurable hardware for that purpose. But what we can just say that, okay, I, I would support at max four features, but which four features that it's, that's up to you. I mean, it would come with an out of box configuration, but then you can just simply change it. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so firstly, uh, I yeah, two questions. First one is, um, what's the hardware cost um, of implementation in the existing hardware prefetchers? And then what's the delta of this one over those? Mm -hmm. Okay, so the hardware cost is actually like, uh, if, if you want to say hardware cost in terms of the uh, like the amount of storage that we need, so this is 25.5, right? The bingo that one uh, that I showed here, it, it has something like 46 KB around. So we are almost like half of the Bingo's performance, like Bingo's area. But then if you if, if you also go back to SPP here, right? SPP is actually like really lightweight. So that's like six KB around. So yeah, so we, we, we are somewhere in between, between six KB and 46 KB. I mean, like, are those currently implemented or are, are those other like cutting edge things that are still pretty far away from being implemented? I'm curious about what are actually the cores these days 
Mm -hmm. uh, hardware prefetchers even used in industry right now? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure either. Like, well, what type of prefetchers they they are actually using in the processor? But but yeah, I mean, I won't be surprised if they have something similar to SPP. But yeah, I don't know. Yeah. And then my second Sorry. question. Yeah. Um, yeah, my second question is. I guess like it seems like you've evaluated um, like thousands of workloads and dozens of prefetchers. Uh -huh. So I'm curious about like how you do it. You know, is there like some standard simulation software where everybody who creates a prefetcher sort of like also releases an implementation on this simulation software uh -huh. and then same for workloads or like do you have to like recode all the different simulations from scratch? No. So what we did is basically uh, we use the ChamSim version, right? And the ChamSim is something that we use in the community. We also use for the uh, like a data prefetching championship. So that's the name come from ChamSim, right? So, so in the championship, it, it happens, I guess, a couple of years, like in two years or something. And everybody writes code there. So you can essentially have the code, same, like same hand optimized code from the original authors, right? And then the traces are also kind of like pretty standard. So you, you, you can download traces from their, their website. Uh, like you can think of it as a data set, right? So you can download it from their website. We have also uh, like traced out our uh, traces, right? I mean, we, uh, we have generated our new traces and we have also pulled, uh, like pushed it in the main repository. Like they, they would all, they can also evaluate using our traces. So, so yeah, I mean, essentially what the, the framework that you guys would be working on on lab four, it would be the same exact framework. So if you, if you are coming up with any new prefetcher idea, you can literally uh, publish it in, in, in the championship. Cool, okay. Yeah. Jill. So uh, you formulated uh, system bandwidth as a reward, like, or, or the, you depend the reward on system bandwidth. Mm -hmm. So that would mean in my understanding that it has to relearn every time the bandwidth changes. Right. So, so it, uh, until it adapts its decisions, it's well, going to well, take time, uh, right? No, well, no, well, not it, it. It's not relearning it in that sense, but it's continuously learning, right? So yeah, I mean, in some sense, it's relearning, but it has to, but it would learn continuously. So the expectation is that, given certain time of uh, like training time or let's say like adapting time, it would understand what, what what's going to happen in in the future. Also, does it make sense? It's not that like. Your program's behavior is also changing, and based on that, your prefetcher is also adapting to different types of memory bandwidth usage. Right, so it, it basically goes hand in hand. If the program behavior changes, you would learn, and it changes again, you would learn again. I see. So, so it might be able to actually learn, for example, fastly fluctuating band system bands. It might be able to learn about yeah, that as yeah, well. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Okay, uh, do we have any more questions or otherwise I would just simply hand it over to the next one. Thank you. Oh, yeah. I guess I was curious about um, the, the, one of the motivations for this project, which is the demand for customizability. I'm not sure if I fully understand um, the extent of this advantage. Do you have any case studies, I guess, um, that, that have been seen in industry where a lack of customizability has cost the company a, company a lot? Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so there is some uh, like, there is a prefetcher from IBM Power uh, Power Seven, Power Seven or Power Nine, so that has this customizability in 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 software, right? So you you can literally tune how aggressive your prefetcher using software, like you 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 can hand code it, right? But then, as far as I know, like Intel's prefetcher or AMD's prefetcher are not that customizable. I mean, not at all customizable in, in hardware, let's say. Okay, but but. Yeah, so we have like tried to show in the paper that like what is the usability of uh, this adaptation, right? And how much you would lose out performance if you cannot know what to adapt, right? So if you if you go uh, let's say to the appendix section, uh, you would see like like different different workloads would also have different types of features that they are favoring, right? So if you literally can hand tune all of this, right, and you can like extract a lot of more lot more performance benefit. But yeah, well, I, I would like to take the question offline because yeah, I mean, I will try to send it to the next one. Make sense? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll go back to you. Okay. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Okay, great. Uh, I think we can we can continue with uh, the next speaker. Thanks, Rahul. Is Geraldo ready uh, to present? 
Maybe you can switch to the next set of slides also. Right now I see Pythia's overhead on the picture over here. That's correct. Okay. Yeah, I think it's good that uh, there was a lot of interaction uh, during the lecture. Uh, I would encourage people to ask many questions. I mean, we, we plan to cover four uh, papers today, but for some reason, if we cannot cover them, we'll cover them uh, tomorrow. And today we kind of have a hard stop because as you know, there is a class that comes after us. Uh, Okay, so Geraldo uh, is going to present uh, this work that was published at PACT 2021, which is a collaboration between uh, our group, Safari, and, uh, and Google. Uh, this was part of Amirali's PhD thesis. Uh, Amirali was my PhD student at CMU. And uh, the work is titled uh, Google Neural Network Models for Edge Devices Analyzing and Mitigating Machine Learning Inference Bottlenecks. And this is an analysis of edge machine learning models uh, that are developed and deployed uh, at Google systems, uh, different kinds of machine learning neural network models, I would say, as Geraldo would describe. And these neural network models have different characteristics in terms of, com in terms of computation and memory uh, requirements in the accelerator. And you will see an analysis of both the characteristics of the neural network models, as well as uh, their execution on Google Edge a TPU. If you remember, we've seen pictures of the TPU that was developed by Google to accelerate machine learning tasks. And those TPUs, tensor processing units, are systolic array-based architectures. And Edge TPU is specifically designed for Edge devices so that this machine learning inference can happen in the Edge. And we have an analysis of that here. And then the paper proposed that heterogeneous accelerator uh, that takes advantage of the characteristics that we analyze. Okay, is, uh, are, are you ready, Geraldo? Or maybe not fully, so. Hello, hello. Okay, <clears throat> thanks, Honor, for the introduction. Uh, sorry for the overheads of context switching. Let me move this around here. Uh, people cannot see. Yeah, you can minimize the pictures if you want, yes. or the videos. Don't see the, you see it more? There it is. Don't see the button. Okay, good. Excellent. So thank you so much. Uh, let me start from the previous slide, which is or it's not working. Okay, sorry for the overhead. So as Honor said, uh, this work was led by Amirali doing his internship at Google in 2019. <laughs> And was recently presented at PACT 2021 by um, me. I was I'm one of the co-authors of the paper, and it's about uh, executing machine learning workloads on the edge efficiently. Uh, I'm not going to repeat the title. I just said it. So first, a briefly execute summary of what this work is about. So just to give a context, so we go to Google and then we start analyzing their machine learning models that they have that they were running on the state-of-the-art machine learning accelerator, the Google HTPU. And we use 24 different Google uh, Edge models varying from convolution neural networks, LSTMs, transducers, and CNNs. And those are actually production models that are used in your Pixel phone or on some other Google products that are Edge devices, like on Google Home or something. So after doing this extensive profile, we, had, we understand that the HTPU accelerator will suffer from three main challenges. Uh, the first one is that it was operated significantly below its peak system throughput. The second one, it was also operating significantly below its theoretical energy efficiency. And also that the memory subsystem was quite poor. So it was handling memory access quite poorly. So based on all of that, we figure out that the main shortcoming is that it was uh, um, faced by the HTPU was uh, is monolithic design that is trying to target uh, one size fit all type of model where we have different machine learning models in a single uh, systolic array uh, organization. And because of that, the HTPU accelerator would not account for layer heterogeneities and also uh, heterogeneities across different machine learning models. 
Uh, based on that, we propose a framework called MESA. Uh, MESA consists of a, of a heterogeneous set of accelerators whose data flow and hardware design are specialized for a particular set of families. I'm going to explain later on what a family means here. Uh, families of layer for, uh, uh, from neural network models. So we extensively evaluate MESA and for Google workloads, much, uh, for those 24 Google Edge models. And we saw that it improves uh, performance and energy efficiency by three and 3.1 times uh, compared to the baseline Google HTPU. And also it reduces the cost and improves the air efficiency of the accelerator. So this is the outline for this talk. Uh, first, I'm going to give a brief introduction about the HTPU, the, the problem that we are facing. Then I'm going to provide some clarification about our profiling for the HTPU and for the models that we are going to analyze. Uh, present Mensa, Mensa G, which is the uh, proposal that we do for the Google Edge uh, models themselves, then evaluation and conclusion. Uh, feel free to stop me at any time if you have any questions during the talk. So first with the introduction. So why do you want to run machine learning workloads on the edge? So this is happens for many reasons, right? First, uh, because of privacy perspective. So you're not in a cloud in a data center sharing your data, you have your phone in your pocket. Uh, the second one is connectivity. You are not limited by having Wi-Fi or internet connection to do some machine learning models. It's quite nice because recently, the, I don't know if you guys saw the Pixel 6 announcement. The main difference from the, they have two versions, a pro and a no pro model. And the main difference is the pro, no, the pro model can do uh, many machine learning tests offline. So like, I don't know, translation or real-time translation or image detection. Uh, and this is one clear example of why you want to do uh, have a, a machine learning accelerator uh, on your phone itself. Uh, then latency, of course, uh, is much faster. You're not bottlenecked by the, by the network. And also bandwidth. Uh, again, you are not in a cloud setup. You are running stuff on your phone. So just the physical connections are much faster. However, at the same time, uh, if you just run it, the machine learning inference on your phone, you are going to suffer from, uh, from many problems because they like, I'm, I'm picking up on a phone here as an example, but you can extend this to other uh, edge, edge uh, devices. But then you'll have a limit power budget and limit compute, uh, compute resources. Again, going back to the new Pixel 6 phone X example, uh, this is exactly why you cannot run those tasks offline in the no pro model, which costs 200 uh, francs less than the pro model. You're paying for this edge accelerator here, basically, um, and one other stuff but basically it's because of the accelerator. So to solve this problem, uh, big companies like Apple and Google are starting to uh, adapt or to include uh, edge accelerators in their uh, devices. Uh, and one good example here, or the example that we are targeting, targeting in this talk is the Google HTPU device itself. So at the other side of the, of the spectrum, we also have a crescent amount of different machine learning models that are arriving right now. So before in the past, we have, uh, people were more interested on, for example, convolution neural networks and everyone was talking about AlexNet or something and image recognition. But right now we re uh, rapidly change. So now we have, for example, recurrent neural networks transducers that are used for speech recognition. So that feature in the Google Pixel phone that automatically translates uh, uh, voice from one language to the other is using this type of um, model together with uh, less uh, long short term memories uh, or LSTM models that are doing the language transition part of stuff. And also now we have uh, more emerging uh, models that combine those different models like uh, recur uh, recurrent convolution neural networks that are usually used for image captioning. And now we have a challenge because <clears throat> we have a, a design of an accelerator that is targeting some particular uh, convolution, uh, particular model, like for example, CNNs. But now we have this, all these different type of layers that have different layer properties or different uh, uh, execution properties I'm going to show next and different requirements that needs to run in this machine learning accelerator. Um, oh, sorry, I present I put some wrong, but okay. So now I'm going to show this characterization that we do and highlight the problem that this mismatch have, uh, creates when you go to real models in, uh, in a real accelerator. So just as to give a baseline, what is a HTPU accelerator? The HTPU accelerator is a regular systolic array accelerator that is composed basically of a, of a DRAM and a processing element um, 
processing element array, again, this historic array, and some uh, large uh, on-chip SVRAM buffers. So the machine learning model itself is stored in the, in the DRAM, and then during the, the inference execution, the, the layers from the models are brought, is, are bring to the accelerator layer by layer. So the models consist of pretty much uh, input activations and parameters. Those are pretty much uh, the data that you're going to run the machine learning uh, model against, and also the pre-trained pre pre weights that uh, you, you do, we did before the execution of the inference. So those are the input and parameters. Um, in this, the case of the HTPU that we are analyzing, we have uh, uh, this processing element array, which has 64 by 64 um, um, multiply accumulate units, uh, which can reach a peak throughput of uh, two teraflops per second. And we have a large SVRAM buffer of four megabytes uh, to hold uh, both input parameters and activations. And on top of all of this, we need to map the computation that of the machine learning model to the SRAM, to the to the array of processing elements that we have. And this is called the data flow of the accelerator itself. So there is a fixed data flow accelerator that is designed for the for the set of machine learning workload to run on the HTPU. So uh, we took this HTPU, uh, a real one, again, this is important to highlight. Uh, and then we also took 24 different edge neural network models on Google to do this profiling. Uh, so we those models consist basically of six, six uh, recurrent neural networks transducers, which again are used for speech recognition, 13 convolutional neural networks uh, used for face detection, uh, two LSTMs used for language translation, and three recurrent neural networks, which are used for image captioning. So after doing some extensive profiling, we identified that the accelerator was suffering from three main challenges when running these 24 different Google models. Those challenges were that the accelerator was operating below its peak throughput. It was also operating below its peak energy efficiency and also was handling memory access quite inefficiently. So I'm going to break, break down each one of those problems next. So it starts with the first one, uh, operating below its peak throughput. So to figure out that this was the case, we will rely on a roofline model. A roofline model is a simple model to identify if a system or application is memory bound or compute bound. Uh, so in, here in the X axis, we have the arithmetic intensity of, uh, of, the, of the application in flops per byte. And the Y axis, we have the throughput of the application in teraflops per second. And then we plot the, the, the arithmetic throughput and the performance of each one of those different uh, machine learning, 24 different machine learning models that, uh, uh, using Google when running on the accelerator. It's also important to say that we have two lines in the roof line model. Uh, the first line here is called uh, compute roof, uh, which is pretty much defined by the peak uh, compute throughput of the accelerator, in this case, two teraflops per second. And this other line here, which is called memory roof, which is defined by the arithmetic intensity times the memory bandwidth, the peak bandwidth, provide by the system or accelerator. So if the model is not that important over here, but it's good to know if the model is below, if the point is below the compute roof, uh, it says that this application or model is compute bound, or if it's below the memory roof, the application or model is memory bound. So if you, after plotting and explaining all of this, we make some observations. So first we see that there are some models like LSTMs and transducers that uh, achieve really low peak throughput from the accelerator was achieving less than 1% of the two teraflops per second provided by the accelerator. And there are even other models that are known to be quite uh, compute intensive, like convolution neural networks or current convolution neural networks. Even them were also taking pretty low, uh, was achieving really pretty low peak throughput from this accelerator, only half of the available uh, throughput uh, provided. So we do again the same observation for the energy. The accelerator was operating below is upper bound for energy efficiency. And again, we rely on a roofline model for the applications. Uh, this is a tiny bit different roofline model. Um, again, uh, in the x-axis, we have the arithmetic intensity of our application in flops per byte. And in the y-axis, now we have the energy efficiency in teraflops per joule achieved by a particular uh, model. 
So uh, we see that there are some models, again, LSTMs and transducers, were operating quite far below the upper bound energy efficiency of the accelerator, around 33%. And also, the, in the best case, the CNN models was also operating in half of the upper bound energy efficiency of the accelerator. Finally, the third problem is that the accelerator was handling uh, memory access quite inefficiently, uh, both in the off-chip memory traffic. So remember that you have a DRAM connect off-chip to accelerator. So, and this off-chip memory traffic was taking a large part of the uh, energy, uh, in, in the inference energy and the performance of the accelerator. And also inside the accelerator itself, the, the, we have a big SRAM and the, and the cost of moving the data within the SRAM through the processing element array was quite uh, cons uh, consuming more, a lot of energy and performance also. So here to highlight that problem, I have again uh, a subset of those, uh, I guess actually those are the 24 models here or the 20, 20 I think it's a subset because otherwise it's supposed to be too, too long. Um, but anyway, we have the, the models here, the x-axis, and in the y-axis we have the normalized energy breakdown uh, of the different elements of the, of the accelerator, including the RAM, parameter buffer, of chip interconnection, processing element array. Uh, the static energy, the energy of the accelerator sitting doing nothing, and the energy of the activation, bu activation buffer and uh, internal uh, network on chip. So based on this plot, we make some observations. We can see that around 46% uh, and 31% of the total energy of doing inference is, uh, is being spent on bringing the parameter uh, from the DRAM to the, from, to the accelerator itself. And also 31% was only distributing the parameters across the, the processing element array itself, which is quite large. So um, uh, computation was not taking that much energy and data was creating a big problem over here. So after uh, highlighting all of those three problems the accelerator was uh, facing, the question is now is why? So where are these this problems or challenges coming from? And to further understand this, we go deeper and analyze now the layers themselves uh, and see how they are behaving or which properties they are, uh, they, they, those layers have. So the first insight that we do based on this analysis is that there is a large variation in terms of layer models characteristics themselves across those 24 different machine learning models. So as an example, here I have some metrics that are relevant for the design of the accelerator. Uh, uh, we consider, uh, I think, four metrics in the paper. So here I have parameter footprint. So this is telling me how much of the SRAM buffer I need to have inside my uh, um, inside my chip itself. And here in the y-axis, again, I have the arithmetic intensity flux per byte that tells me pretty much gives me an idea how much I should dimension my uh, processing element array itself, how many of them I would have to have to achieve a certain peak throughput. So as you can see in this, in this plot, uh, there are some layers, like for example, uh, LSTMs and transducers that have quite large parameter footprint range from uh, one to 10 megabytes, but at the same time, they have really low uh, floats per byte. So the, the compute uh, intensity of them are quite low. On the other hand, there are layers like CNNs and RCNNs that have uh, not so high or quite low parameter footprint. And at the same time, they have quite high uh, uh, compute intensity in force per byte. Uh, so it's the first insight that we, that we make. Another insight that we make is that even with, within a single model, so within a single convolution neural network or within a single LSTM, there is still a large variation in terms of layer characteristics. So a CNN, for example, has many layers, right? And the different layers are responsible for, for different um, parts of the computation, like extracting uh, features from an uh, image, for example, and I don't know, then doing the image characterization. And these different layers uh, require different uh, computational resources because they have different um, properties. So here, as I, uh, I have, for example, uh, the CNN models. Uh, we can see here in this plot, so here I have a CNN, and I have the, 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 the CNN has many layers, and in the x-axis we have the different layers. And the y-axis we have the number of multiply accumulation um, operations that are executed within a single layer. And as you can see, there is a large variation in MAC intensity, up to 200 times uh, across different layers. 
at the same time, um, I have a different neural convolution neural network here, different layers, and the y-axis I have the arithmetic intensity in flops per byte for that particular model. And as you can see, the flops per byte ratio also varies uh, within uh, the same model across different layers of up to 244 times uh, doing this inferior execution. So then we identify that the root cause of all of those problems that we saw previously from the accelerator was that the, the key components of the edge TPU device that we are analyzing is completely oblivious to the layer heterogeneity or the model as heterogeneity uh, that we have observed for when you profile the layers themselves. So basically, the edge TPU accelerator is a single one site fits all monolithic accelerator that needs to. Uh, over provision, the size of the processing elements array, the size of the on-chip buffer, and to whatever uh, custom uh, machine learning model that you uh, might come up with. And at the same time, has a rich data flow, so data always move um, in the same way in the accelerator, independently of the amount of, for example, reuse that you might have inside a particular layer or model. And at the same time, the DRAM has a fixed bandwidth. So as I showed before, there are some models that has really low um, uh, float per byte ratio. Uh, this is a good indication of data reuse also. And then uh, for that type of operations, we would require more of cheap uh, bandwidth because buffering in the, inside the array itself is not that efficient. So that is one problem that, for example, is not catered by this uh, accelerator over here. So uh, why having all of these in mind, um, uh, all of these problems in mind, we are going to provide a solution, which is our Mensa framework. Um, so the goal over here is pretty much to fix all of those problems that we just identified, right? So we want to have a solution, one accelerator or a set of accelerators that can somehow cater for these different models properties and also different layer properties inside the single model. Uh, so the goal, the key idea of Mensa is instead of having a monolithic one side fit or accelerator, we are going to have a framework that can design different accelerators, smaller accelerators, um, to uh, a family of, of layer properties. So this slide goes always a little bit slow. Okay, so this is the overview that you have uh, we have so far. Uh, in a regular HTTP accelerator, have many different models with many different properties uh, being executed in a single monolithic one side fits all accelerator. Instead, means in your proposal, we have those different models, and then we have different uh, uh, accelerators that are catered for the properties of those different models. And doing the execution of the inference of the of the particular model, we um, we have the software runtime system. They are going to identify. Uh, based on the properties of the layers, which accelerator we should run this, uh, would provide the best performance to run their particular layer on. Uh, so this is a brief overview of the of the Mensa framework and or the key idea. And I'm going to give a brief overview of how this runtime, the software runtime scheduler uh, works. So the goal of the runtime scheduler is to identify to which accelerator a particular neural network layer should run on. Again, recall we are moving from one side fit all accelerator to many different accelerators. And these different accelerators have different processing element arrays, different uh, 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 bandwidth to DRAM, different um, uh, sizes of on-chip memory and different data flows. So we need to figure out uh, if I have a new layer, uh, if a new layer shows up to which accelerator I'm going to execute that particular layer. So this is Kedler, uh, it has three main, uh, uh, input. So first, uh, we require the data flow graph of the neural network model that uh, is being executed during the runtime, um, during the, the inference, and this is uh, this is known uh, uh, prior to the execution. And also, we require the characteristics of the accelerators that are available on the line for the execution. Uh, so the size of the processing element arrays, the size of the SRAM buffer, uh, and the different data flows, and also the layer characteristics. So is this does this layer have higher arithmetic intensity? Does this layer have high uh, parameter reuse, or it, it has high or low MAC intensity? And all of those, uh, and this is important, because as I'm going to show next, 
all of those properties of those different layers tends to group in that small number of layer families. So uh, we don't need to have 24 different accelerators for those 24 different machine learning models. We can have a much smaller subset of uh, machine learning layers because of this group, this natural grouping that happens when you uh, we have machine learning workloads. And at the same time, each one of those layers are going to cater for different um, uh, acceler the different accelerators are going to cater for different layers. And all of this uh, 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 setup is generated really uh, once during the initialization of the system. And it's important to know that uh, uh, the models that are working over here have quite a static behavior. So we know during the compilation, the layer characteristics. So it's not uh, something that's going to be generated uh, during the, the some, we need some dynamic profiling or something like that. So this is why it's, it's possible to generate uh, all of this information prior to the execution. So we have a uh, run, um, uh, heuristics that is described uh, in the paper that uh, is just a grid heuristics that is going to go layer by layer and figure out based on these two informations here what is a, a good mapping of uh, of accelerator to layers and then it uh, is going to generate a layer mapping for a particular inference of that particular layer. So I'm not going to go to the details into the scheduler algorithm over here uh, and I invite you to check the paper for more details. Uh, is there any question so far? Sure. I thought one aspect of edge devices is that they're like super customizable to like the particular place where they're employed. And so if you have it such that the, um, like those inputs um, to the scheduler are um, set up once, you know, um, during the configuration of the system, is that like a very strong limitation on its uh, applicability? So uh, I don't fully understand your, your question is if, um, I have a sea of, of different models of different accelerators. If there is a limitation of, of the applicability of this framework, uh, I mean, it's essentially that. Um, well, I feel like there'd be a bit of like online, like after you deploy an edge device, you probably train it a bit as well, right? Or like, like to tune it a bit to its particular person whose voice it's recognizing. And so um, um, I'm wondering how, like, how this uh, plays with that, right? Because you have to extract, you have to perform those like, characterizations um, during the, the initial setup of the system. Yeah, so I think, uh, so when you are training the model themselves, you are pretty much generating the uh, input uh, activations, right, for the machine learning model. Uh, so you're pretty much generating like the data that's going to be stored, not necessarily the model itself. So ILSTM, uh, there are like, there are different LSTMs that we have, for example, they are catered for different, um, uh, uh, language translation type of uh, uh, applications. So the model itself, how the model is structured, the number of layers, or the how much computation we do within a layer, does not is not going to change based on your personal data. Uh, what is going to change just the input that is going to be used, and uh, so we, the model can uh, give you the language recognition of the speech recognition for your particular voice. So the what I'm trying to say is that. Uh, the training part is a parameter of the is an input to the model itself. Is not an input to the uh, to the hardware design of the accelerator because the the model is already predefined. Yeah, that makes sense. Thanks. So, like, I guess the only hard coding you have to do, or the only like, yeah, fixed thing is like the physical structure of those models. But exactly. The parameters. Um, yeah. Um, this um, Mensa can adjust to any kind of different parameters. Exactly. Yes. Okay. Any other question? Okay, so now I'm going to present. Oh, so Mesa frame, the Mesa framework, as, as the name is stated, is a framework, right? It's just this general idea of uh, identifying the layer heterogeneity and providing different accelerators for, for them. Uh, we actually implement or we apply this framework uh, in those 24 different models, and we call this uh, Mesa G, uh, which is the Mesa for Google uh, Edge models. So I keep talking about this layer families that uh, layers tends to group into families. Now I'm going to finally explain uh, what that means. So when you are analyzing those 24 different models, we saw that the majority of the layers tends to group into different layer families. And these layer families have different uh, quite uh, clustered properties. So to illustrate this uh, here, Again, I have those. Uh, I have some metrics that are quite important to the design of the accelerator, parameter footprint, 
sorry, uh, floats per byte. Uh, uh, in the other plot, I have the number of multiplication and accumulation operations that are executed in millions. And again, uh, uh, floats per byte in the OI axis. And each one of those plots are different layers from these particular models here. Uh, so as you can see in the plot, so uh, we can see five different clusters in the plot. So the first two clusters are from what we call families one and two. And all of those families, uh, this, this layers in families one and two have low parameter footprint. They have high data reuse uh, defined as the, the number of floats per byte, as you can see here, it's quite high and high Mac intensity here. Uh, and you call those layers compute centric layers. So you're going to, later on to design a compute centric accelerator. Um, then we have uh, layers in families three, four and five uh, which, uh, so this is four, three, and five. And those layers ha have high parameter footprint, uh, as you can see over here also, low data reuse in arithmetic inflows per byte, and um, also low MAC intensity, as you can see over here. And we, go, we are going to call these uh, layers data-centric layers. And again, we are going to design some set of accelerators for them. So, um, Based on all of these characteristics of those three of this of this family and fam family layers, we are going to design three main accelerators. So the first one is called Pascal, the second one is called Pavlov, and the third one is called Jacquard. And all of them uh, have different size of process element arrays, uh, different data flows, different size of activation buffer and parameter buffer, and different bandwidth um, provided by the DRAM chip itself. So I'm going to start explaining the first accelerator, which is called Pavlov. So Pavlov is a is a accelerator cater for families one and two, which are the compute centric accelerators. So it has a large processing element array, but it is still smaller than the processing element array of the of the baseline HTPU, which was sixty four by sixty four. This one is thirty two by thirty two, and can reach two teraflops per second. And it has a two hundred fifty six uh, activation buffer, which is a eight times reduction over the four megabytes uh, buffer on the on the, on the, I think it was eight four megabytes if I'm not recall correct. Don't don't caught me on this math. But uh, one time reduction on the on the baseline HTTP accelerator and a 128 parameter buffer, which provides 32 um, uh, a 32 reduction of the size of the um, on the on chip buffer itself. And uh, at the same time, is a on chip accelerator, so the DRAM is connected to the to the accelerator itself uh, using off chip links. Uh, this is important. Uh, this is important because again, those families are compute centric, so they do, they have quite high data reuse, as I said before, and so it's much better for us to uh, to bank on uh, buffering activation and parameters on the chip rather than rely on high data bandwidth to bring uh, data to the chip itself. So this is why these 32 gigabytes per second are enough to achieve high performance for these compute centric layers. The second accelerator is Pavlov. Uh, Pavlov uh, caters from the data center layers in families three. We have accelerator only for uh, the LSTM. LSTM has quite uh, some particular characteristics. Uh, it has really low, uh, um, really low reuse, uh, data reuse inside the accelerator itself. And this is going to impact, impact the accelerator design. So, uh, and at the same time, it has really low MAC intensity. So we only need a eight per eight processing element array, which achieves 124 gigaflops per second. And this is enough for the execution of LSTMs. And uh, it has a small 120 activation buffer, again, because of this low uh, data reuse that I just described. So this is a 16 reduction based on the HTP accelerator. And we remove completely the parameter footprint because there is no data, there's no parameter reuse or the parameter reuse is extremely low. So it's much better to stream directly the parameters from the DRAM rather than try to buffer the on chip. Because if I buffer, I'm not going to reuse it. So it's the buffering is useless. But at the same time, to provide high performance, I need to do it with a high bandwidth memory. Uh, so to do that, uh, we place this accelerator inside the the large layer of a 3D stack memory, and we call these our need data accelerator. So uh, we can achieve this high 256 gigabytes per second uh, bandwidth required, so we can reduce or remove this uh, parameter buffer. And third, we have Jacquard. Jacquard, uh, again, is a data centric accelerator, which is scattered from uh, layers in families four and five. Those layers are basically for non-LSTM data centric layers. 
uh, again, since those are data center players, they don't have that large MAC intensity, but it's still higher. They still have more MAC intensity than the, the layers in family tree, the LSTMs. And so the processing elements array is a tiny bit larger, is, is, is 16 by 16. Uh, it has a 128 kilobytes activation buffer. And even though it, it has low data reuse, they still has some data reuse uh, for parameters. So we do keep some parameter buffer inside the, the array itself. Uh, and again, since those layers have uh, quite uh, um, uh, uh, high demand for the, for the memory bandwidth of, this, of, the, of the system, we place this accelerator inside the 3D stack layer of a 3D stack, of a, a, 3D, a large layer of a 3D stack memory. So for more details about each uh, one of the accelerators, again, we can check, uh, please check your paper. And it's important, I skip it over here because it's quite a detailed description, but it's also important to say that we have a data flow design. So data, remember the data flow is how uh, computation and parameters move inside the, inside the accelerator for each one of those three different uh, accelerators. And they, they are going to take advantage of different properties of the layers, like, I don't know, special and temporal reuse for a particular layer. So um, for all of that, uh, please check our paper. Uh, is there any question about Mesa G before I enter the evaluation? Sure. So just to make sure I understand, all three of these separate accelerators put together actually take up less resources than the um, thing they'd be replacing. Yes, so it, it, take, it reduces the resources with, uh, compared to the, if you uh, combine everything, it's still smaller than the baseline HTQ system. Another question? Okay. So uh, now I'm going to briefly talk about the evaluations. So first, uh, I think the main metric that you have for uh, edge, edge devices is, is, is rather energy instead of performance. So it's the first metric that you're going to look at. And here I have the energy breakdown normalized with the baseline HT2 accelerator uh, for the different elements of the system and for different layers. Uh, in the x-axis, we have the baseline Google HTPU accelerator. We have the baseline HTPU accelerator uh, using a high uh, off chip bandwidth memory to see if that would solve some of the problems. And we also have uh, our MESA proposal here. So based on this plot, we make some observations. Uh, the first one is that the our proposal means that G uh, is, is, lo is lowering the on-chip and off-chip parameter traffic by 15 times by properly scheduling layers to the most appropriate accelerator and also by uh, doing some tricks on the data flow by doing this special and temporary use, for example. Uh, and also because we have uh, the uh, memory, so, uh, some chips are placed inside the, the 3D stack uh, memory itself, so we don't go off chip. So this is why you are removing the off chip traffic. The second observation is that we are reducing the dynamic energy of the on chip uh, uh, buffers and also the in, uh, the network on chip by almost fifty times compared to the baseline with high bandwidth memory because we are avoiding over provision uh, the accelerator itself. So the accelerator only has the amount of hardware that is needed for the for the layers that are mapped to it. To it. And also, again, because we play some tricks on the uh, design of the data flows. So in conclusion, uh, on average, Mesa G improves energy efficiency by three times compared to the baseline HTP accelerator. Another metric is the throughput, so uh, the, the inference throughput for the accelerator. Again, here I have different layers or different, uh, different models, sorry. And the normalized throughput compared to the baseline HTP accelerator for those, and also the, baseline HTP accelerator with high bandwidth memory and Mesa. So there's not much uh, magic in this plot. It's just to show that Mesa also improves the throughput of the execution of the, of the layers by 3.1 times compared to the baseline HTP accelerator. So there are much more things that are left out on this talk, but it's, they are in the paper. For example, details about the runtime scheduler, details about the data flows for the accelerators. We have some energy comparison uh, against some other state-of-the-art uh, accelerator that, but this is, was not, this is not from industry, this is some academia called Iris uh, version two. Uh, we have some uh, plot for utilization of, of the Mesa G accelerators and also some uh, values for the inference latency for, the, for those different uh, models and layers. And all of that is in our paper. 
So before I conclude, uh, I want to see if there is any further questions. Sure. So if the layers are run on a different accelerator, so how are data pass between this pass through to the next layer? So this is a good question. So with our runtime scheduler actually is designed to see how much com the how much interlayer communication uh, a particular model are going to to suffer from. So if I place one layer in, 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 in Pavlov and the next layer from the particular model is also in Pavlov, it's fine because they, they share this, the, same, the same accelerator itself, right? The problem is that if one layer is in Pavlov, but the next layer should be in Jack Quart or something like that. So the runtime scheduler figure out, so it first maps this model uh, or this layer to, uh, to this its, its best uh, accelerator based on this, this layer's properties. And later on, it walked through the data flow to figure out how much uh, layer communication uh, would be required by placing the other layer, by placing the, uh, by considering how to place the other layers also during the execution. And if this, this communication is really high, uh, instead of placing the, the layer in the ideal model, it places the layer to the common accelerator that should be, uh, uh, should execute the other layers. So this and and the and there is a threshold that we empirically figure out to see which value uh, uh, from which point it makes sure to pay for the communication or to or to to pay for the moving the accelerator to the non-ideal uh, the layer to the non-ideal accelerator. And but it's also important to say that from the, all of those layers that we have here, I showed here those twenty four. Uh, we figure, from the 24 models, we figure out that often those layers does not, there is no much interlayer communication across those models. So on average, the, the models uh, communicate, uh, the layers communicate only around four or five times during the execution of the, the, the model itself. So our model has many, many layers and only around uh, five times there is some communication across those different layers. So hopefully it answered the question. It makes sense. Uh, and to make sure if the data need to be passed by this, uh, decided by the scheduler. So does it go through the DRAM or? So is 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 the is through the DRAM, right? The DRAM is is the share of other. So there is a, uh, uh, the the space, the memory space is shared across every, everyone. Another question. Okay, so I'm going to conclude. Um, I'm going to go fast this uh, on this because I guess you guys understood. So the context is that uh, we went to Google and then someone gave us some machine learning uh, HTTP accelerators for us to play around and different um, uh, machine learning models that were employed at Google itself. And those models were varying from traditional CNNs to uh, more um, uh, other models like LSTMs or transistors. And after we did uh, some profiling on the layers in accelerators, we figure out that the accelerator was suffer from three main challenges, which were it was operating below its peak throughput, below historical peak energy efficiency, and it was handling memory access quite poorly. So the based on this analysis, we figured out that the problem is the one side fits all design of the HTTP accelerator, which does not cater for the different properties of the models and the layers that are being executed on top of it. To solve this problem, we propose a framework called Mensa, which consists of an uh, heterogeneous set of accelerators whose data flow and hardware design is specialized for the properties of different uh, layers of uh, families of layers. And then we implement this frame, uh, we, imply, we implement this framework using those 24 different Google models. And then we figure out that by doing so, we can improve performance and energy and while reducing the area cost, uh, the cost and the area of the accelerator itself. So that's all, and thank you so much for listening. And no other question. There is a question. Thank you. Um, so I think um, like the original uh, PPU has high memory and high compute. So I guess like for any future model that Google might want to, um, you know, like uh, release, would you say that this kind of specialization um, proposed in this paper um, sort of disqualifies a certain class of layer, i.e. like the high compute, like the very high compute and the very high data intensity type of layer from being employed in the future? So, yes. Yeah, so it's, it's a little bit hard to say 
so th there is a some problem here because like when you are in a production team in a company, it's like you always provision for the future, right? And it's always usual, like by Moore's law, it's always easy to just like increasing continuously increase uh, the size of the processing element array or continue to increase the size of the SRAM buffer. And you gain some margin performance improvements on top of that, right? So this paper goes a little bit against this idea of just doing the, the, the easy and continuously just increasing the size, saying that this is, this is not useful for everything. Uh, so if uh, uh, in the future, we expect to have even more and more diversity in the type of models that we're going to execute because machine learning is, is being used to pretty much any task that you can imagine right now, uh, we need this layer heterogeneity and we need this uh, model heterogeneity to further improve performance. So and this margin performance that they are obtaining right now by increasing the size of the, of the computer or the memory, uh, at some point is going to saturate, right? Usually the curve of, of, of uh, resource gain is like a, a highest type of curve. And then when I, I expect when they reach to that line, they are going to figure out, yeah, so what can we do? And what they can do is exactly this, uh, improve uh, to bank on speciali further specialization of the accelerators themselves. Um, would you, wouldn't, wouldn't you run in a chicken or egg problem if you implement this type of accelerator? Because then you make it very good for some models and then a new model very, very different will maybe perform poorly. And so no one uses it on the edge. And then if no one uses it on the edge, then you're not inclined to Included in future generations, does it's that make a, sense? Yeah, yeah it makes a lot of sense. It does it falls up in the chicken and egg problem at some point, because uh, it's quite a real re retroactive type of uh, uh, engineering, right? So uh, we designed by uh, by for X models. So and the next generation, the team needs to keep uh, figure out if those models are useful for the uh, state of the art layers that just arrived, and design for new layers and. And, and continuously improve the system, right? Or removing some accelerators uh, or putting new accelerators over there. So this is not much of a problem because this already happens when you design a SOC. So you're already trying to figure out which applications are running that particular SOC and, con and continuously changing different elements, changing the prefecture based on the applications or changing the, the, the design of the cache hierarchy. It's not just like a continuous increase. There is a... There is some uh, engineering that goes based on the target applications that are running the system and change over time. So Mesa is actually provide the substrate for you to do it in a methodical way, uh, actually. So you don't simply uh, throw around anything on, on top of the accelerator. So this is saying like, go profile the accelerator, figure out those metrics, figure out if you have a new layer of family, uh, if you can map the layers to one of those families and then to a particular accelerator, or if this point generated a new uh, family of layers and now you need a new accelerator for the new generation. So it's, it's just increasing that, it's just applying that engineering that you already do for other components of the system, now for machine learning also. So, yeah, maybe maybe I will also uh, answer this question a little bit. Uh, and I think uh, Geraldo's answer was very, very good for sure. But uh, keep in mind that the baseline accelerator, there's no guarantee that the baseline accelerator will work well for these new models that will come up also, right? So uh, basically, it's about the design mindset in the end. And it's clear that the baseline accelerator is extremely inefficient in existing models. Uh, so uh, when, uh, when you evaluate these two ideas, the baseline versus Mensa, uh, you should think about them. Okay, uh, a new model comes, which one's more adaptable? I don't think the baseline is adaptable to the uh, new model, uh, but Mensa framework as a framework itself is more adaptable because you can always say, okay, maybe I can map the layers of this new model, new machine learning model that nobody knows of uh, before the design. Maybe, maybe I can map some of the layers to these accelerators that I've already designed, or maybe I design an accelerator that can cover whatever is not covered uh, by what I've already implemented. So in a sense, the mindset is, design mindset is very different from having a single monolithic accelerator. So I don't think uh, basically uh, existing accelerators that are monolithic uh, answer the question that was asked, what happens with future models? Probably they're, uh, 
also inefficient, if not more inefficient than Menza, as Menza results show. But that's a very good question, I think. In general, what happens with future models is something that uh, we need to tackle and we need to have frameworks and methodologies that can more gracefully handle, gracefully meaning much more efficiently and at higher performance handle uh, potential future models. Okay, if there are no more questions, we should probably move on to the next. Yes. I saw some questions. Oh. I saw some message on the chat. I don't know if some those are questions. Okay, there is a, a question here on Zoom. Are these different accelerators fundamentally different or is the same underlying hardware accelerator? Uh, well, my question was just answered there. Okay, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> those are different, fundamentally different accelerators. So thank you so much for listening. And I guess. Okay, great. Uh, thanks, Geraldo. And Okay, I think we're running a bit late. So if, if people don't mind, we should just keep going. If anybody needs to take a bio break, I mean, feel free to go out and come back. This time, at this point, is probably a good time because we're switching uh, between talks. So you probably have one or two minutes to switch. And it'd be good to uh, continue and finish whatever we can because I'm not even sure if we can get to the last talk uh, at the speed. But I think it's good that people are engaged and asking questions. Uh, these are some cutting edge research that was presented. So for example, the PTA paper was presented in October, which is last month. And the Mensa paper was presented late September, which is about two months ago. Uh, so you can see that these are the cutting edge of uh, the, uh, the respective topics that we are covering. And now we're going to switch some uh, gears. And uh, Lois, uh, who is a postdoc senior researcher in my group, uh, is going to present, uh, well, whatever you see in the title, Codec, a low-cost substrate for enabling custom NDRAM functionalities and optimizations. We talked a lot about DRAM uh, in the lecture. So if you remember, uh, we looked at a lot of optimizations in DRAM, latency optimizations, uh, and also some security optimizations that we didn't really go into a lot of detail. But Lois is going to describe a new substrate uh, that at low cost enables control of internal DRAM timings uh, so that you can actually achieve multiple different types of functionalities. For example, uh, a better latency control, lower latencies, as well as some security functionalities, hardware security functionalities like uh, physical and clonable functions. And he's going to motivate those as well. So I think this is looking into the future of DRAM, can we actually make the DRAM interface better and control some of the internal timings through the memory controller so that we can enable new functionalities for DRAM? And this was presented at ISCA this year, which happened in uh, June, so just a few months ago. Lois, please uh, go ahead. Okay, thank you for the introduction, Anur. Uh, yeah, this is the paper that I'm going to present now. Uh, it's called it allows a cost substrate for enabling custom interim functionalities and optimizations. And yeah, I will start with the executive summary. So uh, the problem is that the timing of internal DRAM operations is fixed, which hinders the potential of DRAM for implementing new functionalities and optimizations. And the goal of this paper is to provide control over DRAM internal circuit timings to enable new functionalities and optimizations. So to this end, we propose, we propose the codec substrate. And the key idea of the codec substrate is to enable fine-grained control of fundamental DRAM internal circuit timings that control key basic components in the DRAM array, like the board line, sense amplifier, or the pre-charge logic. So we propose and evaluate two codec variants. Uh, the first one is called codec seek that generates signature values that are uh, just uh, unique identifiers, and a codec deck that generates deterministic values. And uh, our codec variants has, uh, have low latency. And using uh, this substrate uh, and these variants, we propose and evaluate two applications for, for this. And the first one, uh, two applications in the security domain. We have, uh, there are more potential applications, but we evaluate uh, two in, in the paper. The first one is uh, codec-based physical and chronological function or path, and uh, a path uh, generates signatures unique to a device due to the unique physical variations of the device. And the key idea uh, of, uh, of uh, codec-based uh, path is to use codec seek to generate unique signatures that can uniquely identify a DRAM device. Uh, we show that our approach is 2x faster than the best state of the art DRAM path. 
And our second uh, application, uh, we, um, we evaluate, uh, propose and evaluate using uh, CODIC, is a CODIC based cold boot attack prevention mechanism. So, what is a cold boot attack? So, in a cold boot attack, the attacker physically removes the DRAM module from the victim system and places it in a system under their control to extract secret information. Our key idea uh, in this uh, application is to destroy all data at power on using CODIC. So the attacker cannot uh, basically read any data from the victim. So uh, our approach does not incur any latency or energy at runtime, and, and it is 2x lower latency and 1.7x uh, lower energy than the best state of the art mechanism during the run power on. We conclude that CODIC can be used for implementing very efficient security applications and CODIC can enable new DRAM functionalities and reliability performance and energy optimizations. This is the outline of, of the talk. I will start with uh, uh, the background. So this is how uh, DRAM is organized. So DRAM is composed, uh, a DRAM module is composed for multiple DRAM chips that work in lockstep. And each chip is composed by multiple banks. And one bank is, is compo composed of uh, two D array of DRAM cells organize it uh, into rows, uh, yeah, into rows. And one row is selected using uh, the word line. And yeah, this is how uh, the run cell looks. It's composed by a capacitor that stores um, data in form of charge and is connected to the bit line through a, um, an access transistor. And each bit line is uh, connected to one S, uh, SA, uh, one sense amplifier in the row buffer that uh, senses and amplifies the content of uh, the run cell. So this is a more detailed uh, view of uh, the run. So we, here we have the cell, we have a capacitor, the access transistor and the bit line. And this one here is the uh, sense amplifier that is composed by the sense amplifier itself that senses and amplifies the content of the cell and a uh, precharge unit that is necessary uh, to, uh, to prepare the bit lines to activate the line. Uh, so, um, uh, the rank operates with some internal uh, signals, right? And these are four are some of the most important and we will use them in, in our work. So first the word line controls the access transistor that connects the cell capacitor to the bit line. Then we have sense, uh, sense P signal that controls the PMOS amplifier in the sense amplifier. We, has the, we have the sense N con, uh, signal that controls the NMOS amplifier in the sense amplifier. And then we have the EQ signal that controls the pre-chart unit that sets the bit line to half BDD when we need to prepare the bit lines for, for uh, the next access. So um, from the memory control, we can issue uh, several commands. And uh, we, I will explain here four of the main ones. And, which internal DRAM signals we need to trigger to actually implement these commands from the memory controller. So the first one is the activate. That, uh, the activate command activates the DRAM row containing the data. And here I show uh, different components of, of the uh, different states of the voltage uh, in the DRAM. So we have here the bit line voltage, the capacitor, and then we have here the three signals that are involved in an activate command. So first, so this can be perf is performed in two steps involving three signals. In the first step, uh, we raise in a, of an activate command, we raise the word line to share the charge between the cell and the bit line. So here uh, we have the capacitor with uh, uh, this is uh, this is uh, one value with uh, one uh, voltage, and basically we charge we. Uh, share the charge. So meaning we can see here that the voltage in the, in the bit line increases slightly. So next, the sense amplifier can sense that difference and amplify to the, to the full value. And then what we do next is activate the sense N, uh, is to trigger the sense N and sense P signals to sense and amplify the small charge in the cell. So to sense and amplify these, we trigger uh, these two signals and we amplify to the full value. So another uh, uh, command is the read command that reads a column of the data from the row buffer. Another uh, command is the write command that writes a column of data in, in, into the run. And then we have the pre command that prepares all bit lines for a subsequent activate command for a different row. 
and uh, the signal involved in the uh, in the charge command is the EQ signal that basically uh, when we act activate it, we set the pre-charge, sorry, we set the pit line to half VDD. So it's ready for the next access. So next I will go to the motivation and goal. Uh, so many recent, recent works change timing between the run commands. So uh, we have seen many works that uh, uh, use this reduction for improving latency, uh, for example, between a, an activate and a read command and, and they do it from the memory controller, right? They, they issue some uh, commands, but with reduced uh, uh, timings. But they have fixed the run internal circuit timing. So each of these commands that you, you issue from the memory controller in the DRAM are implemented internally with these signals that we saw before. And we don't have control over them. So what are the limitations of, the, of this fixed DRAM internal circuit timings? So, they are chosen at the same time and cannot be modified. They are conservative internal circuit timings to ensure reliable operation. And the memory controller, controller does not have any knowledge or control over the internal implementations of these DRAM uh, commands. So our work basically explores the potential of controlling these internal DRAM circuit timings and enables more aggressive performance, reliability, and energy optimizations enables new functionalities and may open new areas of research. So we have two basic goals. One is enable new and enhance existing DRAM commands and optimizations by providing a low cost substrate that enables fine grain control over DRAM internal circuit timings. And we design new security mechanisms that have a strong security and high performance by using uh, our substrate. Okay, let's, uh, uh, next I will explain our substrate. And this is an overview. So basically our substrate enables greater control over the run internal circuit timings and it's an efficient and low cost way to enable new functionalities and optimizations. Um, we can control with codec for key signals that orchestrate the run internal circuit timings. We already saw these signals. They are the word line that connects the DRAM cells to bit lines, sense P and sense N that triggers the sense amplifiers and the EQ signal that triggers the logic that prepares the DRAM the DRAM bank for the next access. Uh, Codec can trigger and disable internal DRAM signals in a fine grain manner. What this means that we can uh, uh, we, we can modify the signals with time steps of one nanosecond within a time window of 25 nanoseconds. This enables a large number of possible timing combinations uh, uh, between all four signals. We can basically control the timing of all four signals and uh, all of those combinations with all of those combinations allows us to have 300 to the four different codec variants. Um, in, in the paper, we demonstrate and evaluate two of these uh, variants. One is codec seek that generates digital signatures that depend on process variation and the other one is codec debt that generates deterministic values. I will start with the codec seek uh, that generates digital signatures that depends on process variation. And, and the key idea of, of this variant of codec is to amplify a different cell that we, that we set to the pre-charge voltage or half VDD. So this is how the mechanism works. So the capacitor is initially set to zero or VDD. Uh, here in the example uh, is set to VDD initially, right? So then we raise the word line signal. Um, and second, uh, and then we raise the pre-charge signal. So what happens when, when uh, instead, so the difference with, with an activation is that we open the word line signal. So the, the cell is now connected to the main line, but instead of amplifying the content of the cell, what we do is uh, trigger the pre-charge logic. So we are, uh, basically putting half, uh, half VDD voltage in the bit line that is propagated to the cell. So the cell now will not have a zero, a zero or VDD voltage, it will have half VDD. Uh, so the final value of the cell is the pre-charge voltage, right? So what will happen in the next activate command? So the next, in the next activate command, the uh, sense amplifier generates a signature value that depends on truly random process variation because uh, so the cell is at half VDD. So when you access the, when you uh, trigger the access transistor, 
basically the cell will not disturb the bit line. And the sense amplifier will amplify a bit line that is as high PDD. So if it goes to zero or one, will depend uh, only on process variation. And we will have our signature there that depends on process variation. Any questions about this before? Okay, I will explain the next variant that is coded dead. That generates deterministic values. So the key idea of this variant is to activate the sense N and sense P with a delay between them. And the mechanism is as follows. So we have, uh, as before, a capacitor that is initially set to zero or BDD. In this uh, case, in this example, we have uh, a value of BDD. And then uh, we, raise the, we raise the word line. And um, so now the, the, the capacitor is connected to the bit line, right? So, and now uh, to generate a zero, we first activate the sense N and, and then the sense P. And to generate a one, we generate, we uh, in, invert the order. We generate, uh, we generate first the sense P and then the sense N with a delay between them. So in the, a regular activation, you activate both uh, roughly at the same time. And here we, uh, we activate them with a delay between them. And depending on which one you trigger first, you will generate a, a zero or a, or a one deterministically. So the, there is no randomness here. And that is the main difference with, with the previous implementation. Yeah, and codec deck generates a zero or one value deterministically, basically. In the paper, we also uh, show an optimization of codec seek to achieve lower latency, a new codec variant that generates digital signatures without destroying the content of the run. Um, because in this uh, previous one, we uh, overwrite the content of, of the cell, right? So we have a variant also in the paper, in the extended version of the paper that doesn't require to overwrite uh, the content of, of the cell. And we have more details about the hardware implementation and the low area overhead that is around 1% uh, area overhead. And we have also more details about the, the changes on the DDR and on the minimal changes on the DDR interface. So next I will, um, any, any questions so far? Yeah. So for codec SIG, <clears throat> the point of like a physical unclonable function is that it uniquely identifies your chip. So you probably want it to stay the same every time you generate it, right? Yes. So across different temperatures, you know, would, the, would like that also play into the randomness in addition to the uh, process variation and thus you, can, you lose consistency? Yeah, that's a good question. Actually, we will we evaluate uh, our uh, codec seek under different temperatures and we observe that the, that the responses, that the path responses are, are very uh, stable with different temperatures. So in this sense, uh, our path is more reliable than other approaches that have more variation when you change the temperature, basically. Yeah, we test it basically and we observe that it remains pretty stable. There are some differences, but uh, is uh, not. Let's say they keep uh, the responses are very similar across different temperatures. Okay, I'm not very familiar with um, I guess physical unclonable functions. Um, like, how important is it that you don't make a single bit of mistake? Like, usually, is it is it are these usually fuzzy processes where it's okay if you have like where you can measure mistake, yeah. acceptable mistakes by percentage? Yeah, basically. Um, for example, some previous works, um, they work like uh, as, as follow, right? They, they, they request, um, uh, they do many of these path requests. And then, uh, for example, in, in the DRAM latency path that generates, generates paths by reducing the, the uh, DRAM latency. But, uh, because there are some variations between requests, so it's not, uh, you know, you never get the same response across uh, different requests, but they are somehow similar, but there, are, but there are some noise. So they apply some filtering mechanism. Um, um, and the one that they apply in the paper is, that is, is a very simple filtering mechanism that is just requesting the path like 100 times. And they, uh, they use for the path, the, the cells that, are, uh, that show errors reliably on more than 90% of the times. So they, they choose those uh, 
those errors as, as the path signature. In our case, uh, we show that uh, our responses across different requests are more, much more repeatable than other paths, right? But it still, it's not 100%. It's something like 99 so, something, right? So we use a uh, similar filter, but with uh, instead of requesting the path 100 times, we request it only five, and we show that uh, with five repetitions is enough to uh, like 100% accuracy in our uh, experiments. Amazing, thank you. Yeah, yeah but that, that is a uh, good question. More questions? Related to the substrate. Okay, now uh, let's go to the applications then, the two applications that we evaluate. So, codec can be potentially used in many applications uh, in security, as we will demonstrate here. Um, could be used as custom op uh, for building custom optimizations, for example, uh, to uh, optimize the DRAM behavior and the different environmental conditions, for example, temperature um, or process variation. So you could reduce, for example, the timing between the, when you trigger the word line and when you trigger the sense amplifier, depending on how strong is a cell, how, uh, 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 how much is the retention time, for example. You could potentially characterize the, the cell and apply different uh, timings to different areas of of the DRAM, for example. This could uh, enable also accurate DRAM characterization ba based on similar principles, and even uh, enable new in-memory uh, approaches, like, for example, um, Rocklong or, or, or uh, Ambit, that basically Rocklong, for example, copies internal in DRAM to, uh, to ROS, and there are some approaches that do that in real DRAM chips by basically ac activating uh, two different rows consecutively, consecutively very quickly. And this uh, is out of the specifications of the arranging timing parameters, and they are able to, to clone one row into an, another row while doing this methodology, but the, the behavior is not reliable, basically. So they are able to clone some rows, but in another regions, they are not able to do it. So it's very unreliable. Um, basically, uh, they they don't so one of the problems is that they don't know uh, what uh, what are what is the current state of the run when the, they issue the next activation by breaking the timing parameters right you don't know when you uh, um, trigger the word line you don't know when you trigger the sense amplifier so when you issue the next command breaking these timing parameters you don't know in which state you are because basically the run doesn't provide that information to the memory controller so, but it could, could enable some uh, some more reliable mechanisms. Um, yeah, and we evaluate two cases uh, in the security domain that are physical and chronological function and a code-based cold boot attack prevention mechanism. So let's start with the path. Uh, a physical and chronological function generates signatures unique to a device due to the unique physical variations of the device. And paths are typically used to authenticate or identify a device. Um, a path maps a unique input, what we call a challenge, to a unique output, what we call a response. Um, um, these are some of the, limit the limitations of the state of the art uh, DRAM paths. One is that uh, they have long evaluation times. They require heavy filtering mechanisms to deal with the uh, noise in the DRAM path response, as I explained before. Um, and the responses to the same challenge exhibit high variation with temperature changes. And also data dependency on the data stored in the evaluated DRAM region. So, codex can generate signature values in DRAM that can be used as a path by amplifying a DRAM cell that we set to the precharged voltage, as I explained before in, in, in the codex variant. And the characteristics of uh, our path is that it has short evaluation latency. Uh, it, has, it shows very repeatable path responses without relying on a filtering mechanism. And uh, codex is resilient to temperature changes, as I explained before as well. Uh, so changing the temperature does not influence much the repeatability of the path responses. 
And cold heat responses do not depend on the content of the run as well. So, any question about this? Yeah. Um, can, you, can you give an example of a real world um, programmer application that would benefit from uh, such a signature that, that could? So, what for authenticating a device, right? Or being sure that uh, your device have not been changed by an attacker for other, another device that may have some malicious uh, hardware component. That, but yeah. but um, couldn't you just like do a replay attack then? Just save the signature that the previous device generated and um, replay mm -hmm. that? Yeah, so the Adiran can, can have uh, many of these unique signatures, right? It's not like Adiran um, uh, can have only one signature because uh, a challenge uh, a path challenge uh, is uh, is directed to a different region itself. So you can um, ideally you can request a path to a specific region, and then uh, you will use that path response uh, only once for for authentication. Yeah. But basically, there are many protocols built on this as well, right? So you have this ability. Um, there are protocols that enhance the, the the use this as for basically authentication yeah. or even identification as well. So the second applications and the application that we evaluate are is a prevention mechanism against cold boot attacks. So a cold boot attack is a physical attack on DRAM that involves hot swapping a DRAM chip and reading out the contents of the DRAM chip on another system. So the attacker uh, first disables the power of the victim system and then transfers the DRAM to another system under their control. So basically I have my laptop and an attacker can uh, take my laptop, uh, remove the DRAM and put it in his computer. Um, this is the, uh, so, and, and then reads uh, some data that is in the RAM. Why is this possible? Because uh, cold boot attacks are possible because the data stored in the RAM is not immediately lost when the chip is powered off. So data in, in the RAM is storing capacitors and the data can remain in the cells long enough for it to be stolen. And this data retention effect can be even more significant at, at low temperatures. So our attacker could, Cool, cool down the different chip and have more time to swap the beam to his own computer and store some data. We propose uh, for preventing this attack, uh, uh, codex self destruction. And our observation uh, is that it is possible to protect from cold boot attacks by deleting the entire memory content during the RAM power on. So when you unplug your DRAM and, and you plug it again in the, the attacker plug it again in his system, uh, you have to power on the DRAM again, right? So basically that's the, the main idea. So the key idea is self-destruction a low cost in the RAM mechanism based on coding that destroys all the RAM content during the RAM power on. How does it work? Self-destruction is implemented completely within the RAM. It does not require the intervention of the memory controller. Can use codec seek or codec deck variants to, destroy, to destroy data. So the important thing is that destroys the original data. Uses a dedicated circuit within the run that issues codec commands back to back to all the run rows. Parallelized commands across banks and enforces the GDEC standard timings and destroys the entire memory content at power on, basically. That's the basic idea. And during self-destruction, the DRAM chip does not accept any memory commands to ensure the atomicity of the process. Um, this uh, mechanism does not introduce any performance or energy overheads at runtime because we only need to do it when we power on the DRAM. So it doesn't have any overhead at runtime. Yeah, any questions or the applications? Then uh, I will proceed to the evaluation of our codec path first. So this is our experimental setup. We evaluate the quality and performance of a codec path. In 72 real uh, uh, DDR3 low power DRAM chips and 64 real DDR3 DRAM chips. Uh, 
we use a customized memory controller built with SoftNC, that is a software that uh, is a, uh, is a uh, custom memory controller built in our group as well. And so, and, uh, in our so we cannot implement codec seek, right? In real systems, in commodity DRAM chips, because basically we cannot modify the internal DRAM uh, signals in DRAM. So, uh, yeah, uh, requires, basically requires change, changing the timing of EQ and word line signals to set the cell to half VDD, right? So what we do for evaluating this is to emulate uh, codec seek behavior in real uh, DRAM chips. And how we do it? So we set the cell to, to half VDD instead of with the EQ command. We basically do not refresh the cell during a long time. In our test, we wait for 48 hours. So basically, we write some data in the run. We wait for a long time, and we uh, hope the cell discharge to have the DD voltage. And we do this with uh, different values. So the final content should, shouldn't be dependent on, on the initial data. Right? So we do this with, uh, uh, with uh, several values, and, and we ensure that the cell is totally discharged if for different values, the final value is the same. Yeah, and then uh, we activate the cell and, uh, we, and we generate the, the signature values, yeah. So is this to be expected that when I leave a cell unrefreshed that it tends towards VDD half? I mean, I get that it tends to maybe not call its value, but it's the voltage that it tends towards VDD half always. Depends on the internal architecture of the, of the run, right? But uh generally yes i would say yes but it depends on how this is implemented more questions okay so uh these are the metrics we use for um measuring the accuracy of uh of our paths um, uh, use Jacquard indices to measure uh, the similarity of two responses from the same memory segment. This is what uh, is called uh, intra Jacquard. So this is when we request uh, a path to a specific memory region several times. So, and we measure the similarity between these uh, responses with the intra Jacquard indices. And we also use these Jacquard indices to test the uniqueness of two responses from different memory segments. And this is what we call inter -Jacquard. So this is to test the uniqueness of, of, different, um, of different path responses. For example, for two different uh, DRAM devices or two different regions on, on the DRAM, right? An ideal path should have inter -Jacquard indices close to one and inter -Jacquard indices close to zero. These are the comparison points in our evaluation. First, our codec seek. We implement our codec seek with no filter. So we get robust responses in most cases, more than 99% of the cases, we get the same response without filter. And then we use also a filter uh, using five five responses to compose uh, that this always, uh, uh, we can always obtain robust responses using five path responses in our experiments. Then we have the DRAM latency path that generates responses by reducing the activation latency. In our experience, to, uh, we reduce TRCD to 2.5 nanoseconds. That is the time between the activation and the uh, read command. With no, if we don't apply uh, filters, we don't see path responses. So this is not reliable, reliable at all. And um, uh, we use a filter of 100 path responses to compose the final response to have some reliability. And then we, we also implement a pre lat path that generates responses by reducing the pre-charge latency. Uh, so the latency between a charge command and the next activation command. Um, uh, also, this shows pretty robust uh, responses in most cases, more than 96%. But we also apply, uh, uh, we have a version with a filter with uh, also using five path responses to compose the final response. And these are uh, some results, right? We have um, uh, the three different paths here. We have the inter indices in blue, the intra indices in red. And uh, 
the x-axis we have the Jacquard index and, and in the y-axis we have the probability. So in the Dirac latency path, the intra Jacquard indices are close to one. So the ideal case is all of them are one, but these are, are close to one generally. And in, in, in Prilat path and in our codex path, they are, so basically the Jacquard index is exactly one with more than 99% probability. Uh, regarding the uh, the interjacar indices, so uh, these are very dispersed in the run latency path. Um, in the prelat path, uh, they are also uh, they are not very close uh, to zero in our experiments uh, with DDR3 chips, and uh, in our case, they are very close uh, uh, to zero. Right. So we conclude that codice is very effective at providing very similar response to the same challenge. And CodeSeq maintains uniqueness across responses to different challenges. So we also evaluate the, the evaluation time. So we have the Dirac latency path that is 88 milliseconds, the PRILAT path with, with and without the filter, and our CodeSeq path also with and without the filter. Um, the run latency path, uh, we evaluate it only with the filter because without the filter it's not reliable. And basically you have uh, a speed ups of 20x compared to the run latency path and 100x without using the filter. And compared to prelat path, we can speed up by uh, 1.8x with and without the filter. So we conclude that codicic path is 1.x faster than the best state of the art uh, the path. Um, in, the, in the paper, we also evaluate more uh, DDR3 chips um, um, that show similar results as these DDR4, DDR3 low power chips that we showed the, the results previously. And uh, we show also that uh, codicic path is resilient to temperature changes, uh, more, is more resilient than other paths, so meaning that the responses are very similar even across different temperatures. We also show that Codicic path passes all 15 NIST randomness tests. These are some tests that are pretty standard to measure the random, randomness of a response. Um, we also test the aging. Uh, so Codicic path is, very, is also robust to, to aging So uh, across time. And for doing this experiment, we apply some techniques that uh, one technique this is called accelerated aging, aging. And we basically accelerate the aging of a ground by using higher voltage and very high temperature. So the DRAM is aged uh, uh, quickly. And we show that yeah, it's, uh, the, the, the responses are very similar before and after the aging. So I will show now the evaluation for the cold boot attack mechanism. So this is the experimental setup. We will have latency overheads of self-destruction at power on implemented with uh, codec. Um, TCG, DCG is an approach that is used regular write commands from the memory controller as proposed by the Trusted Computing Group. Then we have Lisa clone, that is an approach that copies bull data in the run, and Rock clone that also copies bull data in the run. And uh, we are giving a power, performance, and area overhead of codec self-destruction co compared to full main memory encryption as well. And these are the uh, full memory encryption we evaluate, Shasha 8, AES 128, and we use for, for this evaluation, we use a Ramulator, that is a, a simulator that we also develop in our group, and DRAM power for measuring power. These are some uh, results. This are the, is the destruction time. Here in the x-axis, we have different sizes of DRAM, and in the y-axis, we have the destruction time, right? So, we observe that uh, our codec approach is 500x quicker than uh, TCG. The TCG, remember, that is just issuing write commands to overwrite uh, memory to store the content of the cells. And we are 2.5x and 2x faster than Proclone and Risaclone. So uh, maybe you are wondering why, why we achieve uh, some speed up compared to Proclone and Risaclone that basically copies data 
but the raw granularity it should be pretty quick, right? So to destroy data. But the, the, the fundamental difference is, is that uh, these two require to move data to destroy the content of the cell, right? With codec, we, we are not uh, dealing with moving data. We just destroy the data directly. This is the source of, of, of the speed, uh, speed apps that, that we see here. So we conclude that codec destroys the entire content of the run at least 2x faster than the state of the art. Um, uh, compared to encryption, uh, so full memory, main memory encryption provides strong security guarantees at the cost of additional energy consumption and complexity. Uh, so, in the double, uh, so for sure, uh, encryption is a very uh, secure way to protect against cold attacks. So, uh, uh, an attacker can steal your DRAM and read the content of the RAM, but if he don't, he, he is not able to decrypt the content, is useless, right? So. We use uh, as comparison points SACHA 8 and AES 128 and Intel Atom N280. And these are some results. Some, uh, some results. So, regarding performance, all of them uh, have more or less uh, close to 0% performance overhead. Uh, yeah, as demonstrated by some previous work, right? They can basically overlap the latency with some other operations. So, um, yeah. Regarding power, this is here maybe the main difference. Basically, we don't have any power overhead because we only apply this at boot time, right? We don't, but in encryption, you, you need to encrypt every every access, every write, and decrypt every uh, every read. So, Chasha 8 and AES 128 have uh, up to 70% uh, power overhead. Regarding uh, the overhead in the processor side, uh, we don't have any overhead because we don't, we don't need uh, uh, changes in the memory controller. And um, this encryption mechanism needs uh, some logic in, in the memory controller to encrypt and, and decrypt data, right? And uh, in the DRAM uh, side, uh, the encryption mechanism does not need any logic in the DRAM, but we need some logic in the DRAM for implementing these uh, programmable delays in the, in the signals, right? So we conclude that Codic has no performance and power overhead at runtime, and Codic has no processor area overhead and 1.1% DRAM area overhead. And in the paper, we propose and evaluate another security application that accelerates secure the allocation with Codic. So actually, this is in the standard version of the paper, not in the original one, because basically we didn't have space to, to put it. Um, yeah. Um, any questions? Yeah. So you need to boot up to um, destroy the data. And so I'm wondering, like, from cold, cold boot attacks, is there any way you can access the, the data, I guess, um, by sort of, of like disabling um, the controller that would be responsible for generating the codec SIG commands? Like, I, if codec SIG is part of the memory controller, right? This would mean you have to bypass the memory controller, I guess, and accessing this no, data. No, co codec SIG is not, is not part of memory controller. So the pre prevention mechanism, it happens entirely in the run. That's why uh, you shouldn't be able to avoid it if unless you figure out how to, you know, uh, do it. But co co the prevention mechanism happens entirely in the run, not in the memory controller. It should be independent of the memory controller. So you would need like some, you need like separate control circuits for every row buffer that generates um, uh, like that, that, that sequence of commands to erase the um, banks on, on boot up. Yeah, so in, on the boot up, basically what happens is a sequence of commands that uh, triggers this codec command in all, in all rows basically. So, yeah. Actually, this uh, so if you see some data sheets from um, some old DRAM chips, you see that in this uh, initi initialization sequence of some of these old DRAM chips, they already uh, refresh all rows uh, for not sure whatever reason. But I mean, it's not uh, hard to implement. I mean, you could implement it like a refresh operation that instead of activation activating uh, the rows, instead of activating the rows, you just use a codec command that in essence is very similar, right? You only change a little bit the, the timing of the signals. So it could be implemented easily as uh, 
a variant of the refresh for of refreshing all of all memory and instead of using activation commands to restore the content of the cell you use it you use codec commands that destroy the content of the cell instead of refreshing it uh, i guess i'm not familiar with the uh, um, architecture of refreshing commands is it still centralized because if so maybe you can um, bypass powering that like location and then we use to is like fly wire directly to like the, the buses would be connected to it and then then and then like you know like like in that way access the capacitors potentially it's possible in paper but i would like to see that i would like <laughs> i would be happy to see how if someone demonstrates that that's possible but yeah at least it's challenging to do right and it's very costly so a cold boot attack uh is um is popular let's say because it's very simple to do right you just take the chip out and plug it in your system that's it and maybe you you cool down the chip with some, with some um cans that you can spray the chip to call call them down to minus 40 degrees and then you have some more time to switch it uh and that's a very cheap attack to do if we start introducing these uh, sophisticated, you probably need very sophisticated uh, equipment to do more, to do something similar to what you are proposing. But yeah, I'm not aware of, and usually when, if you want to read, for example, if you want to read directly the content of different cells, you have to decap the chip, you have to remove the, the, um, the, the package. And this is very delicate. And probably if you start to remove any layers to access the, the capacitor, you probably damage the chip. So, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying it's not possible, but at least it's, it's challenging. Yeah, that makes sense. So I guess like this would be really great just for like 99.999% of people. And then for the nuclear launch codes, you probably want to use memory encryption. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> Basically, this is a low cost approach for the problem, right? But if you, you have very, very, very critical information, but you want to be absolutely, absolutely sure, maybe you want to implement this and on top of this also encryption and on top of encryption also other mechanisms to be 120% sure that nothing is happening. <laughs> so more questions? Also for aging, um, as I, I guess I was very surprised to hear about that because I think in an earlier lecture, um, it was pointed out that an area of research right now in RAM is how well it fares into the future as it ages. And so I guess like how well is aging, like how, how good are the aging models for DRAM in general? Is it just that they can predict some metrics very, very nicely and some not? And so that's why in the earlier lecture, we heard that um, this, this still needs to be researched or um, yeah, I guess how, what's the state of these models? So we didn't do a model for the aging, right? We basically tested experimentally with some methodology, and the methodology is is used by industry actually to test their different chips, and that is accelerated aging. Uh, that is basically put the DRAM under stress, so it's it ages more quickly, and under stress means higher temperatures and higher voltage of operation. So we did that basically with we. Uh, we operated the run under stress, and we tested before and after this accelerating aging test, and we basically saw that the results were similar. Yeah. Okay, so in general, we do have a way to but, know how DRAM works, like how DRAM ages and how it works in the future. Yeah, the, the difficult part here is to um, to map how so you do this accelerated aging, but how how much did you age? the DRAM actually. So the difficult one is to map this accelerated aging period to the real aging. You know, if we accelerate aging for one day, this is equivalent to how many months or whatever of regular aging or regular behavior. Uh, there are some equations that you can use to map uh, that, but yeah. But yeah, I, in general, I, I agree with you that uh, I'm, I'm missing many aging studies in, the, in the, in general, in, in, in academia, mainly. It's not very well studied field. Yeah. I think there is a lot of research to do in that area, actually. Study, understand better how aging affects too many parameters 
retention time, variable retention time. Um, yeah. Okay, so essentially, like the aging literature is um, lacking in um, accuracy, I guess. But like for you, essentially, what you needed was like a lower bound. You would say like this amount of aging is equivalent to at least ten years of heavy use or something. Um, and so like that, like and so even though it's it's not super accurate, that's enough to show that. Um, yeah. Got it. Yeah. Like, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. We don't have accurate numbers, so we just yeah. It's difficult to do, right? Because if you want to do exact uh, exact study. We basically need to wait for five years or whatever. You need to keep testing the DRAM and see how this, for example, if you are testing retention time and you want to do it for a period of 10 years, you have to wait 10 years, right? So that's why there are some other techniques like this accelerating aging that try to approximate, try to emulate this aging. Um, yeah. More questions? So yeah, yes, just, just to conclude. So the problem is that the timing of internal DRAM operations is fixed, which hinders the potential of DRAM for implementing new functionalities and optimizations. Our goal in the paper is to provide control over the DRAM internal circuit timings to enable new functionalities. And to this end, we propose codec substrate, which enables fine grain control of fundamental DRAM circuit uh, internal circuit timings that control key basic components in the DRAM array. And we propose and evaluate two codec variants in this paper. We have an, an additional uh, variant in, uh, in the standard version of the paper. And one is codec dead that generates deterministic values. Another one uh, is codec seek that generates uh, signature values. Um, the codec variance has low latency. Uh, using these variants, we uh, implement two applications in the security domain. One is the physical and clonable function application. Uh, Basically, a path generates signatures unique to a device due to unique physical variations of the device. And the key idea use code is to use codec seek to generate unique signatures that can uniquely identify a DRAM device. And our approach is, is faster than the, uh, the best state of the art DRAM path. And the second application is the codec based call boot attack prevention mechanism. Um, basically, I just explain what the call boot attack is. So the attacker physically removes the DRAM module from the victim system and places it in a system under the control to extract uh, secret information. And the key idea is to store all data at power on using codec. And our approach does not incur any latency or energy at runtime and needs 2x lower latency and 1.7x lower energy than the best state of the art mechanisms during the run power on. And we conclude that codec can be used for implementing very efficient security applications, and codec can enable new DRAM functionalities and reliability performance and energy optimizations. Yeah, and that's basically it. No, not sure if I am. Yeah, it's already pretty late, but if you have any questions, I guess we have to postpone the next uh, talk. And yeah, if you have any questions, uh, go ahead. Yeah. So yeah, with regards to performance, how does um, this ability of arbitrary timing control affect the performance of an optimal memory controller? Can you repeat the first part for the? Yeah, yeah. So like now, like I guess with codec, um, yeah. you know, if you consider that in the design of a memory controller, how does that affect like, the, the the ideal performance of the memory controller? Oh, it shouldn't affect at all, because um, because we implement codec as a separate command point. Uh, and so we still can access uh, the run with the same uh, regular commands, so it doesn't affect at all to the other commands. Yeah. More questions? Yeah, if there are more questions, please feel free to ask because I think uh, we don't have time for uh, the next talk so we will have to postpone it to tomorrow but if there are questions feel free to ask right now that's a good point for discussion also these are actually uh this is an area that's quite important and exciting uh, since we need more security support in our devices and dram main memory even though it's it's ubiquitous and it's everywhere it's the biggest it's 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 perhaps the biggest cost component in our devices that it doesn't have much security support. And this is one of the few works that has been proposing, uh, let's say substrates that can enable such security support more easily.
No, can you hear me well? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, okay, great. <laughs> there was some silence, so. Yeah, I guess I mean, there is no more questions. Yeah, if there are no more questions, then uh, so the the next talk that we are going to cover was on actually a similar issue, uh, which is uh, security support for DRAM, but a totally different kind of support, and it was strategically placed after uh, the Kodik talk. Uh, Ataberg was going to present uh, another ISCA paper, which appeared concurrently with the Kodik paper. And the uh, title of the paper is Quack TRNG, High Throughput True Random Number Generation Using Quadruple Row Activation in Commodity DRAM Chips. And that's certainly another type of security support that's important to provide in DRAM. And this sort of security support can be useful for existing systems uh, as well as uh, future systems like processing in memory systems. So that's true for Codec as well. If you're doing processing in memory, you really need this sort of security support in your DRM devices. But unfortunately, we just don't have time to cover the Quack TRNG work. So uh, we, will we will decide how to juggle uh, it, but my suggestion will be perhaps, since we're already running out of time in our schedule uh, this semester, my suggestion would be to have five talks tomorrow and go a bit longer. Uh, and again, none of this is required and you can, you can actually uh, 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 listen to it in your own time. Uh, and then we'll make some other time uh, for, uh, yeah, I think it's best to cover five talks tomorrow, but uh, especially we don't have any other class that's coming after us tomorrow. So uh, let's see. Does that sound good? And today we'll end right now, I think. Okay. If, I think we can end, Lois. Okay. You have the control of the live stream and everything, so feel free to end it whenever. Okay, take care, everyone.